Was it all just a dream? On the 11th of September, 2001, a date that will live in infamy, New York City was attacked and the world would never be the same, nor would the entertainment industry. You see, when those towers came down, they also knocked over a domino that shook up Hollywood like a giant Etch-A-Sketch. Join us for a pop culture infused ride through America's darkest days. This is life. This is us. This is 9-11. Live from Los Angeles. 911, what is your emergency? Here in Hollywood now. Two counts of murder, injury, and death. Oh my god! Shocking new details that has stunned the entertainment world. Um, this makes me a little nervous. The hair stood up on my arms. Just like in the movies. Ah! What do you call this thing anyway? Death in entertainment. What is going on, Deto Universe? Hey, yeah, yeah. Here we are, man. Here we are. We are back, fresh off the two-year anniversary. What? Of Death and Entertainment. Really? Thank and you. the twenty-two year anniversary of nine eleven. That's right. A lot of an- a lot of important things happened two years ago and twenty-two years ago. Yes. yes. We are one eleventh of nine eleven. Okay, I'm going to do the math on that. I'll get one math. tenth. One tenth. Okay. I'm still kind of shaky on that. But. I went to school dumpster diving into uh, the Tang Factory's dumpster, so <laughs> my brain doesn't quite work. It's but like also, goodwill hunting, but you learned in the dumpster. <laughs> the reserve. <laughs> the reverse. <laughs> you did equation in the dumpster <laughs> of a Papa Gino's. <laughs> I'm smart. <laughs> How you like them slices? Yeah, he's wrong. How do you like them slices? <laughs> <laughs> My buddy's wicked not smart. Yeah. <laughs> He's wicked mediocre. <laughs> he does basic math. Anyway. What's going on, everybody? My name's Kyle Plouffe. My name is Mark Mulcairin. And I'm Alejandro Dowling. And you are joining us. This episode is about 9-11 and how it's affected media before, during, and after the tragedy. This actually feels like... Like a college course in media. Like hey. It would be something that I would take actually at like UMass Amherst and like by a very liberal professor. Yeah, very liberal community college that yeah. you know wants to waste everybody's time for an hour. Okay, let's not get, <laughs> let's not get at Jordan Peterson here, but but the professor would talk me into being a member of Al Qaeda. Let's be honest. There we go. Okay. <laughs> but the best part about our crass course is it's free. That's right. Yeah, for you, my friend, free, free ninety nine. So get in the car. We're going to September 11th, 2001. All right. Pop culture flash the week of 9-11-2001. Alejandro, what was going on at the box office? Well, this was a pretty shocking box office, in my opinion, because the number three movie, the week of 9-11... America's greatest tragedy. <laughs> well, I don't know about greatest. Greatest, yeah. Or biggest, yeah. I don't know. Like, yeah. <laughs> America's most awesome tragedy. <laughs> most tubular thing that ha- yeah. tragedy that happened. Bill and Ted's most tubular <laughs> terrorist attack. <laughs> oh my God! Why did they do that? <laughs> the number three movie was directed by America's greatest pedophile sex offender. Yeah. Oh Jeepers, my God. creepers. Yeah. You want to explain a little for the for the layman, for the non for the people at home. For the non dentists for the people at <laughs> for the kids. Well, maybe not for the kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Get the kids out of the room. Yeah. Please. Victor Salva. He was financed by Coppola since the eighties. Had a an affair with a twelve year old boy. Oh, I wouldn't call that an God. affair. Yeah, I would call that a uh, pedophile taking advantage of a child sexually. Finance meaning like he <laughs> he he finances movies. He like he used some of that that Coppola wine money in order to make this fucking brilliant movie, Jeepers Creepers. Yeah, <laughs> the original movie was Clown House, and yes, Kyle, I was gonna say that it was not a consensual. Yeah. A relationship. Imagine okay. a nine-year-old smoking a cigarette, being like, "I had an affair with a married man." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the year was two thousand one. Yeah. The movie. It Jeepers was my favorite. eighth birthday. <laughs> Would I do it again? You bet you. <laughs> Victor Salva. <laughs> Victor Salva. I'm doing the fucking. Doing the Robert, I'm doing the Robert Evans thing. Okay. <laughs> I we really have that. to explain our humor <laughs> to the we're, deados at this point. We're only on number three of the movies right now. Yeah. This is going to be a disaster. <laughs> oh my god! It's going to be the world, the America's biggest disaster. Greatest. Victor Salva got out of jail. He made powder for Disney. 
The movie, that is. Not a, Yeah, he made Coke. <laughs> Not a great movie. And then Jeepers Creepers in 2001, financed by Coppola. And yeah. Coppola made a lot of money on this horror movie. Yeah. Did it make good money? Oh, yeah. That's why there's Jeepers Creepers 2 and 3. Yeah, there's like a straight-to-red box franchise now. Yeah. <laughs> Say what you will about Justin Long. He could sell a horror movie. People yeah. will come out to see him in a horror situation. See the you Jeepers know, Creepers, Barbarian, Barbarian, <laughs> in the, right. the Walrus. It, the list really falls off. <laughs> oh, the Walrus! Yeah. yeah, a little long goes a long way. Or it was oh, Tusk. Nice. Tusk. 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 That was yeah. yeah, the Kevin Smith. Yeah. All right, who Weird cares? Movie. All right, number two. Two can play at that game. Coincidentally, number two. Mm. Oh, okay. Number two. Number two. Yeah, a couple of years before, but yeah, we get it. Before uh, what? Before it, it came out, or after it came out. What? Awesome Powers was 99. The first one was 97. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Let's not mix up our timeline. Yeah. Here. So This two, is not the multiverse. Mandela this, effect. This is the here. real, real <laughs> verse here. Yeah. <laughs> two could play at that game. Is that Morris Chestnut there? Uh, and Vivica A. Fox. Yeah. How's that? A little rom-com. This yeah. is a non-controversial movie. I, it, it's not. Unlike number three. But that's why we're going to go to number one now. Let's do it. Number one movie, the week of 9-11, The Musketeer. He's missing two of them. Yeah, there's just one musketeer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This did not excite anyone. I guess it made some money. Who's ever watched this since then? I've never heard, even heard of this movie, barely. Is this the one I believe Tim Roth was in it? And you know... The kids love Tim Roth. <laughs> yeah. The kids come out for Roth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this week they were coming out for Roth and Victor Salva. Yeah, the kids love the, the ninth lead in uh, Pulp Fiction. Yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's the movies. I am curious at what people were listening to on their Walkmans. Oh, we got the number three music according to the Billboard charts, Someone to Call My Lover by Janet Jackson. Okay. Yeah. That's a solid track. Sure. You know? Yeah, yeah, why not? Someone to call my love. It doesn't uh, inspire me or bring much out of me, but uh, I like her. I think she's yeah. great. A couple of years later, they um, Justin Timberlake ripped her, her breast off. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the second greatest tragedy in yeah. America. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That day, uh, she got her titty ripped off <laughs> yeah. in front of America. I didn't yeah. think that was cool. 2001, The Towers Fell. 2004, her bra fell. Yeah. Hey uh, Number two, Fallen by Alicia Keys. Coincidence? I think not. 9-11? Alicia Keys was uh, paired up with Osama bin Laden. Yeah. Was that the green light when that when they uh, released that song? That means, ata, go. Red <laughs> team, go. <laughs> <laughs> number one, I'm Real by Jennifer Lopez. I'm real. Oh, that was a good song. I, I like Jennifer Lopez. I've talked about that before on this podcast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you're a big fan. I'm a nope. J-Lo head. That's and in right. 2001, she really was everywhere. This was her Jenny from the Block era. Yes. Her Puff Daddy, I'm a Bad Girl. She's about to transition into the Ben Affleck. You know, let's hang out with this tall drunk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah she was about a year away from her biggest disaster, her greatest disaster, Geely. Yes. Oh, yeah, that was the biggest disaster. I've only heard about it, never seen it. Did you guys actually see it? No. Yes. Geely? Is it as I bad have... as people think? Or say? It is. Wow. But there is, there are some scenes that are okay. Like okay. there's one with Christopher Walken that is just so bizarre. I didn't know Walken was in it. He is. All right. Yeah, he walks and in right into it. I'm in this movie. <laughs> it's great, I think. <laughs> and Walken, can you transition us into the 9 11 episode? With that being said, let's get into the episode. Nice. September 11, 2001, we're going to be covering, but before then, we had some very famous deaths on 9-11. Jessica Tandy in 1994. 
driving Miss Daisy fame. She won an Oscar. Yeah, she was mean to a black guy. In the movie. Yeah, and in real life, too, probably. Uh, God, <laughs> oh, my. You don't know that. That's I don't know big that. Big assumption. And, well, you know. Big assumption. Right you know. There. You're acting like she's Ellen DeGeneres or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's not known as some, like, behind the scenes monster or something. <laughs> Jessica Tandy. <laughs> Kyle's taking shots already. At, like, she, at didn't even, she didn't even know it was a movie. She thought she was getting driven to set by oh, Morgan Freeman. Okay. Freed. That's. <laughs> Let's keep this keep it moving. train moving. Keep it moving. Alice Alice Stewart Trillin on on September 11, 2001, uh, passed away. An author. An author. And can you imagine? She died of cancer uh, on 9-11-2001. Damn. What a weird way to go. You're on your deathbed, and you're like, what's going on? The Tower of Building 7. Uh, <laughs> That is a weird thing to like be fading out of death and just see like maybe the, wor- the world is like falling apart as you're dying. You're like, oh shit, I'm taking everybody with me. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Some people would like that though. Some people oh, like, everybody like would I want like the it. I want the world to end a- if I'm leaving. Oh yeah. yeah, if I was dying of cancer that same day, I would have ran up to Windows on the World and jumped right off <laughs> and I had myself a steak. <laughs> like you want like the like when you leave a party, you don't want any party to happen after you leave it. You don't want any fun. Yeah, exactly. No. Uh two thousand two, Johnny Football, Johnny Unitas. He was still alive then? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, he wasn't alive after two thousand two. Rest in peace. Yeah. And it was right around the time that uh another uh, Mr. Broadway got in trouble for trying to kiss Susie Colbert on the sidelines. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> right. We've talked about that before. Yeah. Joe, Joe Broadway, I'd like to kiss you. Yeah. And in 2003, John Ritter died on 9-11, which I didn't, uh, I think we've talked about before, but it, I don't think it sunk in that it, it was actually 9-11. Yeah, it was like 9-11 of coronaries in Burbank that day. Yeah. He was on the set of something about my daughter. What was that? Eight, eight rules to date my daughter? Or something? Yeah, eight simple rules to date my teenage daughter that sounds yeah. that sounds sketchy too <laughs> yeah, it's a long long title yeah yeah danny masterson's like what are those rules <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> what she's got to be older than 12 <laughs> <laughs> the hell's going on here no thank you okay and then we have kyle look at this one death of dj uncle ai or is yeah. it al oh Uncle Artificial Intelligence. You can tell I know who this is. Which came out that summer, by the way, 2001, Spielberg's movie. Oh, that was 2001? Mm Mm-hmm. Damn. Death of DJ Uncle Al. He was shot and killed on September 10th, 2001. And he was known for the Peace in the Hood Festival. Ah. Isn't that just depressing? He's preaching for brotherhood and peace, and someone just goes, poof. Mm-hmm. And then he didn't even get to see 9-11. <laughs> he missed out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, have we talked about yet the fact that the movie Glitter came out on 9-10 also? Oh, that's right. Yeah, the, I, and some would say it might have caused 9-11. I don't, I'm just ju- jumping out there and making a big assumption. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it came out like like right before. In like The Mariah Carey movie. Mariah Carey movie, which is also, some would say it was the Geely of 9-11. <laughs> like, it was just a, another bad movie. But some people would say it's the 9-11 of... No, it's like two singers. Nine that, ten. That, yes. <laughs> Don't think it was nine. And other nine. analogies as well. Yeah. But it was just two singers that um, both came out with movies that they probably shouldn't have. Yeah. It couldn't have been nine ten because that was a Monday. But I'm looking up. I think it was either that or it was supposed to come out then, and then they had to delay it because of nine eleven. It came out September twenty first, so shortly after nine eleven. Okay. On September 21st, live the dream with new music from Mariah Carey featuring Busta Rhymes, Nate Dogg, Eric Benet, Fabulous, Cameo, and more. Glitter, Radio PG-13, September 21st. But the promos were out before 9-11. Yeah. So it still could have caused it. The show must go on. (laughs) There's a rumor that Mohammed Atta had to sit through the trailer. I like he's the only only name we remember. (laughs) Like everyone says Mohammed. But also like, yeah, I know what you're talking about, but yeah. name the third guy who did the 9-11. It was like, I don't know what you're talking about. 
the, the day before he asked, do I have time to see Jeepers Creeper? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love it if they, they found ticket stubs like like falling down as the towers went down. Too. Big fan of Mr. Salva's work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, big fan of Mr. Salva. Yeah. I'm a big Salva head. <laughs> He good man. <laughs> <laughs> we those are dead on impressions. We're not just yeah, yeah. just doing random. Yeah, yeah, we're real good. We're real good at <laughs> We're going to basically take our culture back many steps today, I think. Yeah. yeah. What if, no, we're, we're taking it back for America. <laughs> we're going to be doing like the the apology uh like videos like um Ashton and Mila Kunis. <laughs> yes. We've talked to our PR people. <laughs> And I'm gonna be just as pissed as Mila was. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't impress the Muhammad Ada. Okay. Yeah, uh, this is me on September 11th, 1992. Hmm. This uh, is the, my part dad... of the podcast where Kyle makes it all about him. Wait, dad... 92. <laughs> my dad got re- remarried. It was the death of my dad's single days. Okay, <laughs> we're talking about people who died on 9/11. Okay. Oh, <laughs> let's oh. stretch it out here. Your dad got married on September 11th, 1992. That's what I'm saying. Okay, it, fine. Yeah. Is that Macaulay Culkin with you there? Uh, that's it, yeah, yeah, from yeah, My Girl. Yeah. Isn't that, did you know Kaya was an extra in My Girl? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought no, he was his, the good son. He was a stunt double. <laughs> yeah. He did the B scene at the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why is he your stunt double? Because I just don't like the guy. <laughs> he doesn't look like me. I just don't like the guy. Because they're going to really stick the bees on him. <laughs> yeah. I, did I mention I don't like the guy? It was your dad's idea. Yeah. yeah, get these kids out of here. Yeah. Macaulay's like a hard talking like prick. Yeah, I don't like the, I don't like this mook. That's why I got him in here. Yeah. <laughs> oh All right. Well, shall we get into? We have a really, as you said, this is basically a college course yeah. in nine eleven and media. Yes, Marshall McLuhan is. Doing the hustle in his grave today. Yeah. Dun, 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 oh, he's dun, dead. Dun, 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 dun. If Marshall McLuhan was here, th- wasn't he in uh, Annie Hall? He's he like, was. Yeah. He's like, if if he was here, he'd tell you you were all wrong. And then Marshall McLuhan shows up in the line in Annie Hall in the, for the movie. He goes, "You don't know any of my work." Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's the famous movie line where if, if you could only pull out an expert when you needed him. Yeah, and then Woody Allen says to the camera, "If life wasn't just like this." And then, like, now where's my daughter? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my wife. <laughs> same thing. It's the same title. <laughs> okay, so we have, in chapter one, we have pre-9-11 test runs. Yes. We had some of uh, Hollywood's elite getting right up and close and personal with some of the actual hijackers. I recall this, because James Woods was... He's an intense guy anyway, and he was very serious when he was talking on Larry King about seeing the hijackers on a plane kind of preparing for what they were going to do on the on the 9-11 day. Yeah. Uh, he was on a flight from Boston to La- Los Angeles one week before the World Trade Centers were attacked, and uh, he had actually gone up to people who were working on the flight to be like, these fucking guys are... Yeah, yeah. Keep an eye on these guys. Yeah. <laughs> I'm okay though. I'm just, I'm just asking a 14 year old Amber Tamberlin if she wants to go on a date to me. Yeah. By the way, but I saw, at- I saw James Woods at the Commerce Casino and the Rio in Vegas. He's a big poker head. Yes. Yeah. In fact, he was in the same bathroom as me, washing his face in the sink. Just me and him. <laughs> he must have a good night of card playing if you're just washing your face off. Yeah. <laughs> and we happen to share birthdays. Oh. oh okay. But hey, you guys go. I'm not saying I love the guy. Yeah. No. 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 I, no. I've played in the same tournament as him at uh, the Commerce Casino in California. <laughs> here. I feel like the 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 theme is here. You guys are degenerates, just like him. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he had noticed that he was in first class and the only other four people in first class with him were a bunch of Middle Eastern guys. Well, first of all, and I think that's what ticked him off first. That makes it suspect because he's a racist first. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and maybe a pedophile and maybe like, <laughs> cause the Amber Timberland is accurate. She, she did come out, uh, like four years ago and said, he propositioned me at when I was 14 years old, mm-hmm. when he was like 50, 60, something like that. But also, I did believe the intensity in his voice that he did believe. But I don't know how you can tell 
on a flight that people are actually training and like how what what does that look like i have a little clip actually okay uh without going into the details of of what made me suspicious of these four men although it would have been blatantly obvious to the most casual observer uh i took it upon myself to go to the flight attendant and ask to speak to the pilot of the plane the first officer came out I reported to him that I felt that the four men, and I said, can you look over my shoulder and see who I'm talking about? And he said, uh, yeah. <laughs> I said, I think they're gonna hijack this plane. I mean, everything they're doing, and I explained to him these details, which I've been asked to keep private until whatever uh, jurisdiction, you know, uh, whatever trials may take place. Uh, their behavior was such that, uh, that, that I felt they were gonna hijack the plane. I also said, I'm very much aware of how serious it is to say on an American aircraft in flight the word hijack. So yeah. I'm saying this because I really have reason to believe it's true. When I got home that night, it had been a very turbulent flight. I had said to uh, this woman I'm dating and, and uh, my girlfriend and, and a, my best friend, they said, that was the flight. And I said, well, aside from the terrorists and the turbulence, it was fine, which was <laughs> now in retrospect, not such a very funny joke. Wasn't funny any, any point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no uh, point in time in the world was that ever funny. Yeah. He thinks he's being hilarious. He's like, I know I can't say hijack on a plane. Hijack. <laughs> it's my friend Jack over yeah, there. He's Hi. doing his tight five. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and like the balls on someone like, hey, uh, can I talk to the fucking, uh, you know, the get guy. me the pilot. Get me the pilot. Like, who, the, who do you think you There's are? a bunch of brown guys sitting next to me in <laughs> yeah. first class. Yeah. I was the fourth lead at casino. Bring me the pilot. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, it, they say that uh I was in the hard way. <laughs> Bring me the pilot. <laughs> <laughs> I was the co-star of the Michael Jackson movie or Michael J Fox yeah. movie The Hard Way. Boy, you really you were confused mixing up Michael J Fox <laughs> and Michael Jackson. <laughs> Are they different people? No. <laughs> um so yeah, he said that uh during the cross country flight, none of them had had anything to eat or drink nor did they read or sleep. So they were just... They were like putty from Seinfeld. Quiet, sitting in their seats. Yeah, they had their face painted. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, putty on the flight, like, Elaine goes, are you just going to sit there and stare forward? He goes, yeah, that's yeah. what I do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry about that. They, they only sat up upright in their seats, occasionally conversing with each other in low tones. Uh, Woods mentioned that he had noticed, to, or he had told a flight attendant and, who shrugged it off, and uh, he told airport authorities upon landing, and they seemed unwilling to become involved. Uh, but it, it ends up coming out that it wasn't actually a week before the flight. It was actually in August of 2001, and uh, he was probably just being racist. But it ends up he was right because he called the FBI to tell investigators about his experience, and they had said that uh, some of the people who were on the flight with him were some of the actual hijackers on 9-11. Okay. So he, so he was right, but he is, I think, lucky to be right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like a broken clock is right. Yeah. It's right. like throwing a crazy Hail Mary at some point. He's like, please, please, like you're sweating. Yeah. <laughs> and in the clip, why was he so nervous talking about his lady friend? He's like, yeah. my, uh, my girl, uh, my uh, why, uh, girl. Uh, yeah, I girl. know. He goes, the girl I was dating and and my girlfriend. Yeah. Like, and, how many girls you got there? And yeah. my best friend. <laughs> That's going to hold up. FBI is like, all right, well, let's look at that. Too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that might hold up in court that interview is on there. Yeah. All right. So he had a run in with the Ata. Yes. Yeah. The second person who had a run in with hijackers actually on a flight was Mr. Rob Lowe. Ooh. Which I didn't actually know about this one. I know you guys were kind of talking about it, or Mark was talking about it. Um, and I had no idea that Rob Lowe had a 9 11 story. But apparently when it was during the days of the West Wing, he was taking a flight and he, you know, said it, nothing remarkable. He was tired from shooting mm -hmm. and he just went to sleep on the flight, got off. And it wasn't until, uh, you know, a few days later after 9-11, he gets a call or he gets a letter in the mail saying uh, you're on a short list of people who are uh, in contact with the terrorists and they want to depose you. The guy, uh, Mazawi, Musawi. Yeah, Musawi put him. Zacharias Musawi. Yeah, put him on their deposition list as a defense witness. What? <laughs> yeah, and so he had no idea. It was just because he got this letter in the mail, and he thought it was like a fucking joke, and he thought someone was p playing a prank on him. So he immediately called his lawyer, 
and was like, hey, I, I don't know if this is real or not, but they're saying they wanted to pose me in Maryland, so uh, let me know. And he's like, I'll call you right back. He thought Aston Kutcher was going to burst. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, boom! We both fuck kids, <laughs> and we both have been involved in 9-11. No, but what, what if Musawi bursts into the room? To all- <laughs> <laughs> He's in on it. He really yeah, wrote yeah. the letter. <laughs> <laughs> but his lawyer called him back and was like, no, this is real. This is not a fucking joke. Wow. Um, so apparently, yeah, there was a group of guys on his flight as well. And they had uh, gone through the flight log or the l- flight yeah. list of customers and you know passengers on the flight. And the defense <laughs> team for the Taliban was like, get Rob Lowe. <laughs> but I wonder if Musawi knew who Rob Lowe was. Like, did he or like any of the hijackers knew? I that. love the West Wing. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Hey, Tommy boy. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> What, what, hey, what? chips! <laughs> I love your underground sex or underage sex tape. <laughs> you and Victor Sava should collaborate. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the Joel Schumacher movie where he plays a sax and he's very obnoxious. Uh, Rob Lowe? Yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> take your pick. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck, I can't think of it. But anyway, but but something, something that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oh, hold on, I'm gonna look at <laughs> Saint Elmo's Fire. I love doing Saint Elmo's Fire, man. <laughs> fucking Brad Pack, fucking first time. Oh yeah, isn't that the one where he has an earring? Ah, uh, yes, he does have an ear. He's very sweaty, but he's like playing the the sax. <laughs> <laughs> and when you were talking about Rob Lowe not realizing, you know, he's with the hijackers, it reminds me of that scene in Airplane Two. Where the terrorists are going through customs. Oh, yeah. And they all have their like bazookas out and yeah. knives. Yeah. <laughs> and really obviously. That was kind of foreshadowing. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, yeah, I guess. You know. Well, they, but, but they had box cutters. They did not have, you know, e- right. easy rocket to hide. launchers or guns or anything. Easy to hide the box cutter in the yeah. pants. But Dennis Farina around this time actually did go through Chicago O'Hare Airport and he got a he tried to bring a gun through. So Whoa. Well yeah. he's an ex cop. He is an ex cop. I don't know if he had a he I think he had a license, but you still can't bring a gun on board. <laughs> <a Yeah. license. laughs> I don't know if this is post or pre nine eleven, but I remember him trying to do that. Yeah. Uh chapter two we're getting into the attack timeline. Where were we on 9-11? Well, yeah. On 9-11, I was a sophomore in high school, and I remember after second period uh, going to my locker, and a kid that was two two lockers down from me was like, oh, uh, the Twin Towers just got hit with planes. And I was like, did anybody die? And he goes, oh, yeah. Like, I thought it was going to be, I mean, 3,000 people is still a lot, but I thought it was going to be like 50, 60,000 people. You asked if anybody died? Yeah. Okay, remember, this is the same kid that believed the Blair Witch Project. Exactly. <laughs> so, of course. Yeah. He also believed 9 11 was real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's the bigger yeah. joke? And, Mark, where were you? Um, I was in between colleges living in at my parents' house in outside of Boston. Is this when you were selling cars? Uh, no, I, I was not, I didn't have that job. I was unemployed, just kind of like, just kind of milling around and, you know, trying to figure out the next chapter of my life. And yeah. I was, uh, yeah. And then all of a sudden that morning, I, I was not an early riser. And I think I just got up at 9am and just put on the news, just seeing what was going on. I think I was already watching the news because of the George W. Bush, Al Gore thing. And that made me kind of infatuated with the news because I was kind yeah. of like wondering how the hell did this guy steal an election? And then, therefore, yeah. like I, I woke up with the news at that time, even though I was like in my, uh, I was like twenty years old, so I was like still into it. Um, and then, yeah, I just saw it all coming on. It was, it was shocking to me. Um, just I was to like, you, I think, transfixed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kyle was like, he thought. Uh, you know, did anybody die? <laughs> <laughs> Are people okay? He was like, he was stuck between did anyone die versus sixty thousand deaths. Uh, you look- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! I hope everyone's okay. <laughs> and I know we've all heard harrowing nine eleven stories. Mine might take the cake. I was actually on the second floor. Shut the fuck up. Of Fond du Lac High School. Yeah, exactly. He had that long. And I, I had to watch the footage 
on our little box TV yeah. on wheels. On wheels with the seat belt that <laughs> yeah, so holds annoying. the uh, the TV down. Then they <laughs> let us go home early for some reason, even though we're in Wisconsin. They didn't let us go home early. My stepmother picked me up. She was so freaked out. She shows up to the school crying and being like, I've been trying to call your uncle, uh, my uncle that... Uh, oh, this story's great. Went yeah. cross country with his friend with no bicycle seats. Wait a second. Oh, wait a second. You just said a lot of things. Yeah, but we've talked about this before. Yes, you were My entertaining uncle us left one time at the bar with this. Story <laughs> where, yeah, your, your gay uncle went yeah. missing on 9 11. Yes, no one could get in touch with him, but he apparently actually used to take that flight from Boston to LA like quite frequently. And so my stepmother thought that he might have been on the flight. Um, instead, he was just missing being gay. <laughs> You might be gay at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, not even at home. He might have been. I think he might have still been married at that point. Uh, Wait, so he left his wife and kids and just and just left with another guy. Yeah, he was like, "Hey, I'm gonna go on a cross country uh, biking trip with my friend here," and then he came back uh, and they were like husband mm. and husband. And then this is the bike that was missing a seat. Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay, come on with this. Yeah. <laughs> In case you didn't get it yet. Yeah, yeah. okay. Let's... It goes, hello! Yeah, let's go back uh, to doing impressions of Mohammed Atta. Yeah, but he was completely fine, and it was a complete overreaction. But that happened a lot, especially in the suburbs. I'm yes. sure people back, you know, all of our listeners have stories about people freaking out about... I remember after 9-11 happened, they sent, actually sent out a memo at our school and gave it to every teacher to hand to their uh, students that was concerned about a terrorist attack at the South Shore Plaza, which is just the regular mall in Braintree, Massachusetts. Yeah, no one's so, touching that. It's like, okay, they take down Wall Street and the the uh, face of our nation with this these two buildings that you know are worldwide famous and they're coming for fucking hot topic next. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a Bill the Burr Orange clip. Julius. Yeah, I have a Bill Burr clip here. Nice. It was this big talk, discussion. Like, do you talk about it? Do you not talk about it? I remember being over my neighbor's apartment and she had a friend over there and she was just like, I don't even feel safe here. And that was the first joke I got. And I was just like, really? Do you think, okay, the terrorists are going to bomb World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and then 516 East 79th Street? You know, I think we're okay here. Yeah. <laughs> Same idea you were just talking about. Yeah. But at least they were in Manhattan. Yeah, I'd still be freaked out if I was in Manhattan, too. But yeah. the fact that someone thinks, you know, they're going to attack a regular commercial retail mall. Yeah. 12 miles outside of Boston. <laughs> I was very worried being in close proximity to the Fond du Lac Lighthouse. What? Yeah. <laughs> it's a joke, Kyle. Hello. <laughs> I don't know if I, where would I rather be, Tower 2 or Fond du Lac, Wisconsin? To put me at the top of Tower 1. <laughs> <laughs> tower 2 <laughs> fell first, though, so I'm going Tower 2. Well, that was another thing. My dad's whole thing was like, uh, he goes, I don't know how that many people died. He's like, I would have gone to the top floor and held on to the antenna the whole way down. Like, all right. You just wrote, yeah. wrote it down? Yeah. I think I've heard people say that. They would have just kind of surfed it down. That's that's crazy. Everybody yeah. thinks they could have been the hero. They could have survived. It was at free fall speed. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. there was Terminal like, velocity. Like millions of pounds of debris or whatever. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's just, it. yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. I don't I'm just going to ride the wave down. Yeah. He's not coming back. Yeah. All right. So as a reminder, here's what was going on that day. There were four planes. They were overtaken by the terrorists. American Airlines Flight 11, Boston to L.A. This is the one that Mohammed Atta was on. And that crashed into the North Tower at 846 a.m. Then we got 175 United, Boston to L.A. This is the one that hit the South Tower at 903 a.m. Then we got American 77, Dallas to L.A. This is the one that hit the Pentagon at 9.37 a.m. And then we have United 93, Newark to San Francisco. And this is the one where they fought back and they overtook the terrorists. At, and the plane might have been on the way to the White House or the Washington yeah. Monument, who knows? Yeah. And it crashed in a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania at 10.02 a.m. Mm -hmm. And then we're all watching on TV this destruction. And the South Tower 
Tower 2, that was the first to collapse at 9.59 a.m. And then North Tower at 10.28 a.m. And then Building 7 at 5.30 p.m. And Bush, who was our president at that time, not my president, no. <laughs> according to my Fat Records t-shirt that I wore <laughs> all the time in high school. Nice. He addressed the nation at 8.30 p.m. And when all the dust settled, around 3,000 people were killed. Yeah. Awful. Yeah. R.I.P. Yeah. Now that that's out of the way, let's have a little fun. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. <laughs> the harsh news is out of the way. Yeah, so let's go back to that morning, okay? It was a beautiful day. This is the cliche. Yeah. Very sunny, early September day. Yeah, U2 was playing through everyone's speakers. It's a beautiful day. <laughs> and then let's see what was on the news. This is what Mark was watching. It, it was a U2 album that, you know, you didn't get against your will. Yeah. On your iPhone. Oh, yeah. right. <laughs> this is back when we only had terrorist attacks against our will. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of apologies. Hey, that sounds like a Dennis Miller joke. <laughs> hey, <babe. laughs> speaking of apologies, Bono had to apologize for that forced Apple album. Yeah. Oh, did it? Yeah. Good. Because nobody wanted it. <laughs> Uno, dos, tres. Catorce. No one wants this. All right, so Mark, <laughs> you turn on the TV. This is what you were watching. Good morning, America. I'm Charles Gibson. I'm Diane Sawyer, and it's Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. It is beautiful outside, perfect September day with lots of sunshine. Other than that, it's kind of quiet around the country. We like quiet. It's quiet. It's too quiet. He was absolutely the most amazing man that America has ever created, ever. Okay, I have got to interrupt you right now. Sorry. Richard Hack, thank you very much. We appreciate it. The book is called Hughes. We want to go live right now and show you a picture of the World Trade Center where I understand... Do we have it? No, we do not. We have a breaking story, though. We're going to come back with that in just a moment. First, this is today on NBC. I have a woman trapped in my office. <laughs> that was some plug for the book. This the book is called Hughes. We're looking at, a, obviously, a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center... It does not appear that there's any kind of a, an effort up there yet. Jesus. Now remember, oh my, oh my God. That was the craziest that moment like of my life. plane. Because I had just woken up then. This is going to be the kind of a show where we'll have to keep going it back was, and forth. Uh, I guess it's being said that a second plane hit the other tower. Oh. Fucking Gelman. Sounds, sounds like deliberate to me. I mean, I hate to yeah. say anything on, on live TV. A third plane. A third? Oh, oh yeah, this is really something. <clears throat> Three planes. How many, Gilman? Two no, or three? We, I don't, we don't know. Right now, that was a replay of the... Yeah, that was a replay of the second one going Kelly, can into you believe the it? other Eight tower. planes. <laughs> wow, I just can't believe what's happening here. <laughs> I like how he's all fired up on caffeine. Gilman, was it three? Was it two? How many planes? Tell me, tell, tell me. 27 <laughs> planes, Gilman. Uh, yeah, so as this is happening, it's such a crazy thing. Um... I feel like the general public freaked out a lot more than the president of the United States, who was in a classroom in Sarasota, Florida, yeah. <laughs> sitting there completely unfazed by uh, Secret Service going up to him, telling him, we are under attack. He he's sat like, there for seven minutes. He's like, I want to hear the end of this story. Yeah, what was the <laughs> name of the story? My Little Pump, My Little... My uh, Pet Goat. My Pet Goat, yeah. And here's the clip from Fahrenheit 9-11, the great Michael Moore documentary. <laughs> was I dreaming? <laughs> <laughs> He's having a good time. Oh, he's in when his natural element. This is what he signed up for. His chief of staff entered the classroom and told Mr. Bush, the nation is under this attack. Is not what he signed up for. <laughs> she it. Not knowing what to do, with no one telling him what to do, and no Secret Service rushing in to take him to safety, Mr. Bush just sat there and continued to read My Pet Goat with the children. <laughs> well, it's... like you said, he just wanted to know how it ended. <laughs> I want to know how this hands. Yeah. <laughs> 
I'm compelled to hear the third act of this book. And Could, he knew about the first tower before he entered the classroom. Really? Yes. I didn't know that. I thought oh, that really? was the first news. No. What? Because that, that's why the first one they didn't know the nation was. They just thought it was a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. they thought it was a drunk pilot, possibly. Wow. And then imagine how drunk that pilot and but also crafty he would have to be in order to, <laughs> to to crash into the world trade center like whoa yeah <laughs> a little cocaine in there too i think yeah yeah so bush he, you know he he just wanted to kind of coast he was on vacation a lot yeah, yeah he was he he's clearing brush that was his big thing remember that down at the uh the ranch he owed <laughs> No, I no, he did. That was his yeah. big thing. They're like, what, what, like, what, what's your big? What do you like doing down there? He's like, I clear brush. Like, <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? I remember who does that? Ricky Martin performed at his inauguration. Oh my yeah. god! Yeah, he wanted some alone time. It's uh, so funny because he branded himself as like you know this fucking gunslinging cowboy, and so that's why like everyone after this, people were like upset about him sitting there for so long. But after. Even people who hated George Bush like had his back and were like, "We're ready to fucking kill the terrorists." Oh, right. for the first couple, yeah, months. yeah, everyone was fired up. But can you imagine actually knowing his life story? It's like, <laughs> oh my God, get the cheerleader from Yale to safety. He's got to lead this country. <laughs> <laughs> get the draft dodger. Yeah, drunk, drunk, draft dodging cheerleader from Ivy League school. Whiskey guzzling scumbag. <laughs> yeah. And we are fair and balanced here on Death and Entertainment. Yes, we're like Bill O'Reilly. Yeah. So I would like to play the rebuttal to okay. Fahrenheit 9-11. There was a lesser known movie in 2004 called Fahrenheit 9-11. Oh, I don't know this one. God. And in this clip, the teacher from that classroom is being interviewed. Wow. I didn't vote for him, but on that day, at that moment in time, I very easily could have. That was the first time that I could well, think there wasn't of an election in his either. short tenure in office that he looked presidential to me. If terrorism is supposed to strike terror in the hearts of men, you didn't see it on him at that point in time. The media who was there that day, not one person commented the president did the wrong thing. Scumbag. I would like liberals to explain to me Big what scumbag. they think George Bush should have done. You know, run out of the classroom, rip open his shirt, let the bullets hit me first. And she's bipolar. She's like <laughs> out of her mind. She's insane. She's like a uh, like Team America doll. Like she's like bouncing left and right. You have to admit that was kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, her. Yeah, what if they want Bush to run outside, rip his shirt off and say, let the bullets hit me first. <laughs> yeah. And there were no bullets. Yeah. It was planes. Uh, well, anyway, you know, she's kind of a comedian. You, you can be a maniac asshole and have something productive to say sometimes. Yeah. All right. So now we know what Bush was up to. He eventually got his act together. I yeah. think that day. Yeah. He looked down at the, he, they, they, Took him on a plane and flew over the wreckage of not of the twin towers, and he I remember that that famously you know on the phone looking out the window of the plane. Yeah, of Air Force One. And then they made a movie about his day a year later on Showtime, starring Timothy Bottoms, who also played Bush in That's My Bush, the South Park show. Oh wow! Yeah, he was the uh, impersonator for. Bush. He was like that. Was like it made his career. It made it the, the only career he had. Well, no, he was an established actor. He starred in the Last Picture Show in the seventies. Oh, really? Yeah, but he had a, certainly a resurgence. Okay, so yeah. that that kept him uh, that kept him in SAG for a couple more years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if we're talking about nine eleven as it happened, especially through the lens of the entertainment industry, we have got to talk about Howard Stern. Yes. Because he was one of the only broadcasters who was on the entire time. Because that that was like the make the general makeup of his show. He didn't have segments. He just went on whenever he as long as he wanted to, which was typically around four to five hours. Yeah. yeah. Every weekday. Yeah, it was yeah. four hours and then this day they ended up going an extra two. They went all the way to noon. So yeah. You got oh, yeah. even past noon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh so you got every part of you know 9-11 unfolding from new yorkers close by which is insane yeah and you had like all those truck drivers that were big fans that always called in they were like even more so all calling in and they were getting a lot of info from these people that were on the street yeah they uh they were talking to you know one of their friends of the show i forget exactly who it was but uh the guy didn't even know what happened yet and howard's like hey hey hold on we got some news here uh the twin towers were just hit with a plane 
And the guy goes, what? He's like, no, I, I live right near there. I got to look out the window. And then he goes, holy shit. Oh, the whole man. thing's on fire. I got to go to my roof. This is incredible. And then hangs up. Yeah, we have a, an excerpt from that famous broadcast right here. And then to preface this, they're having a discussion about being at a club with Pamela Anderson and Howard is saying that he might have had a shot with her. Yeah. Yeah. So he's living in fantasy land. Uh, that previously, he's living uh, in a pre-9-11 world. Yeah. He's living in the, <laughs> yeah, everything changed <laughs> yeah. on this day. Everything changed, Brian. <laughs> yeah. uh, previous to that, they were doing uh, kind of like a memorial episode, too, for uh, Hank the Angry Dwarf. Yeah, Hank the Angry Drunken Jesus. Dwarf. Did I even say that right? Died Hank the few, Angry Dwarf. <laughs> he died a few days before 9-11. Yeah. I think he had a few names, so I think you're accurate there. Yeah, yeah you could say Hank the Dwarf, Hank yeah. the, but the official name is Hank the Angry Drunken Dwarf. Yeah, yeah that's the full title. And even on this broadcast, before the Twin Towers were hit, they were playing tributes to Hank, and they even had a recording of Hank saying, I'm dead, Jesus. that he recorded before he oh died. My oh, my Lord. Yeah, so, so he was very much in a pre-9-11 world. Yeah. And then Hank got overshadowed after this broadcast. That's so hard. During this broadcast. The shortest guy on the show got overshadowed by the tallest buildings in New York City. At that time. <laughs> yeah. At that time. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, the day before. It was. <laughs> the short shrift. Yeah. yeah. They came Poor down Hank. to his level eventually. Poor Hank. I, I like Hank. He was from Fall River, Massachusetts. He was born and died in Fall River. Fall River. And he appeared in the Toxic Avenger 4. Wow. As God. <laughs> All right, so here's the clip. Remember, it starts out with the Pamela Anderson discussion. You know how I know she wasn't interested in John? We sat with her for two hours, and they were talking about their kids a lot. That's a, that's a way you know. Yeah, that's how you get in. Hey, I, should, okay, uh, I, should, I don't mean to interrupt the fun, but uh, this is a breaking news story, a serious news story. A plane has crashed hold it, into the World Trade Center. You're kidding! The World Trade Center is You're on kidding. fire. <gasps> which is the... What the, is going on? Really? The Let me look out my window. Yeah, it's the, the tallest... just heard you say oh, that John made out with oh Pamela Lee. Look out the window. Take a look, seriously. Holy crap. You know, That's you know, Howard, I, I was just there. I was at a wedding right on... Right there. Yeah, it was like one of those private places? Thank God you're alive. Oh, dude! Do you see it? Dude, it, it's... The to oh, my God. I gotta go out on my roof. This is incredible. <laughs> So this is later, 9.30. Wait, are you I am, showing it again? Yeah, I am speechless. Yeah, I mean, what do you say? What do you say about this? Can't say anything. I, you know, I just feel like nothing will be done. It's just no, like, no, 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 no. Is that I'm Ronnie sorry. the limo driver? I think there say, would be such an outcry that something John. has to be done. They've attacked, they've attacked the United States. Yeah, that guy. War. They're declaring war already. And here's 12.13 well, p.m. This is a PM. devastating day. Is. What is the date today? It is September the 11th. 11th. 12th, 11th. The 11th, the 11th of September. September I love that at the end. What is it? The 12th? The 11th? I know. It's inconceivable to imagine that you could not associate that attack with 9-11. Like, that it yeah. could have been the 12th or the 10th or the... Yeah. As soon as it happened, I was like, these fucking hacks, they're definitely doing this because it's 9-1-1 and that's like mm -hmm. an emergency call. And then it came out that it actually was. Like they really did plan that. Really? Yeah. Four nine the nine one one. Oh. Yeah. It was also some kind <laughs> of right. you fucking hacks. No, it was some kind of religious meaning too. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah. For like um like like Muslim thing. Yeah, I you know I I don't know exactly, but yeah. James wasn't... Woods probably wrote an essay on it. We'll have <laughs> yeah. to find that. We yeah. did more Rob Lowe research here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Al, Al Qaeda stuff. So. Just an FYI. But uh, that would be funny, though, if the um, Al-Qaeda or, or the Taliban thought, like, we declared war on Howard Stern's show and, like, that was <laughs> an official, like, uh, proclamation from our government. Yeah, we have <laughs> launched a jihad yeah. Ronnie on the, Howard Stern. Ronnie the limo driver yeah. declared war, <laughs> and that, that is officially us declaring war. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, th that was... Uh... Legendary broadcast. Yeah. And a lot of people appreciated him being on the air. Can you imagine? Because it's so scary what's happening. And that day on TV, it was almost, there was commentary, but sometimes it was just 
a shot of the Twin Towers burning, yeah. the rubble, and without much commentary. So to be able to turn on the radio and hear Howard Stern, it would be very comforting, I could imagine. I didn't listen to him that day, but I wish I could have. Well, he's the biggest media voice. I know he jokes about being the king of all media, but definitely the biggest media voice in New York for live media. Like, oh, absolutely, mm-hmm. yeah. But Regis and uh, Kelly were live too, and we mm-hmm. showed a little clip of that and that uh, little montage. And she was panicking, mm-hmm. like wanted to leave immediately. Kathy could, Lee? Oh God, no! It's uh, Kelly Ripa. Oh, Kelly Ripa. Kelly Ripa joined in 2001, so she's only a couple months on the job mm-hmm. when this happens. And they're showing the footage of in real time of the planes hitting the World Trade Center, and she is like, "I'm ready to leave. Like, get me the fuck out of here." The crowd's freaking out. They're mm-hmm. all gasping and like screaming. I'd be like, get me the fuck out of this studio. Why am I in New York City right now? And Regis is trying to change the subject. Hey, Kelly, you see those storms last night? Yeah, he goes, oh, we had thunder last night. What did you do today? And she's yeah. like, oh, I was trying to get a lunchbox for my son. And he's like, oh, that's great. And then they're like, another plane has hit the trade center. And he makes a joke. He's like, because she talks about a Tigger lunchbox she yeah. bought. And then he's like, when I was a kid, it was a paper bag. Yeah, my lunchbox was a paper bag. <laughs> yeah, they, they punch you in the eyeball and they give you a, they, they throw a sandwich in your mouth. And, and everyone in the audience. You choke on it and you loved it because you loved your parents. Everyone in the audience is like, there's a tower burning behind you, Regis. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that nice? You know, I remember my first lunchbox. It was a brown paper bag. <laughs> Well, it's tough. You don't really... Uh, Gelman, I don't think, was equipped to know how to deal with the tone of the... The proper tone of, of the moment. Yeah, right. and especially, like... He's no Baba Booey. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, Howard Stern runs the show, so it's just like, whatever Howard wants to do, let's just run with it. But on that, it's a bigger production. Yeah, mm-hmm. and also, like, an old-school mindset is like, hey, keep everybody happy. Like, don't talk about things that are actually going on. Yeah. And so it seemed like he just wanted to distract everyone from the real story, but he's like... "We're well, gonna- he's, a, he's a World War II guy, so they, they're used to, like, internalizing... In bottling up all these horrible things. Yeah. You know, I'm sorry, what were you going to say? It, he also said, like, uh, we're getting in touch with the, you know, the heads of the studio right now to be able to get us to uh, do one of these evergreen shows and we can play a repeat tonight or today. And it's like, why the fuck are you going to do a repeat? Because he Just, wants to get the hell out of there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's <laughs> true, too. Yeah. He wants to go check on his family. And a repeat. We got to get the fuck out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got nine towers hitting the World Trade Center now. Yeah, you see him getting a helicopter and getting the hell out of New York. Yeah. <laughs> and as you can see in this picture, it's somebody watching the footage through a store window, and every TV has the towers burning, falling. Jesus. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened when you turned on the TV that day. Yeah. It, it was, was we, every channel, MTV, ABC, you know, the Spice Network. I know <laughs> everything M- MTV it was uh VH1 chain. Mm-hmm. Like what it used right, like VH1 it's even. It's like pop-up video, yeah. but yeah. they didn't do pop-up 911 for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good idea though. <laughs> okay, and so then knockdown video. Oh, there, come on. <laughs> too soon. What? Too accurate. And yeah. good. <laughs> so there's this documentary that I saw on Amazon called Witness to 9/11, and the night before this tragedy, there was a celebration at Madison Square Garden. Yes. Michael Jackson's 30th anniversary. Mark, did you know that that took place on 9/10? No, I didn't know that. The night before was that infamous concert where Whitney Houston looked really skinny and Britney Spears yes, performed. to bring it back, yes. So that was the night before. And so then you got to watch this clip from this 9-11 documentary. And this is one of those great ones where there's no narration. It's just high-quality footage of people reacting in New York City, in the streets. Beautiful. Yeah. Gotcha. I was there. I just saw it all falling down. You know, I, I gotta believe that there's people were ten thousand people dead down there. Gotta believe that, easily, at least. Easily. The people were hugging and crying over here in the street. Strangers were hugging yeah, and no, crying. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a rare thing in New York City. Yeah. No. This is incredible. We're oh, walking like, down here, headed to the trade center where, where to take you pictures. I'm in LA. I You're flew out here just for this show, the Jackson show. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and coming down here, sightseeing, and the building falling down. Oh, around 10 29 
How'd you, how did it make you feel, Matt? Man, it's just taking all the press away from Michael. You know, they did a great oh, show so last cool. night, and then this shit happened. Oh my God. I could not believe that when I saw it. What does he work almost, for the studio? What the yeah, fuck is that? It's almost too good. I cannot believe that's a real clip. Take a press away from Michael. He's got very big fans, very ardent fans. Wow. Clearly. <laughs> Can you imagine <laughs> the biggest terrorist attack in America? He's like, they took it away from Michael. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now let's get into the next chapter, which is. Oh, there's the, yeah, there's the famous New York Times headline, U.S. Attacked. And another paper printed pictures of the falling man, which oh, is a yeah. great documentary if you can seek that one out, too. Yeah. So well, Witness. That, uh, is that on Amazon also? Well, you, yeah, you can see it on Amazon, I believe. Gotcha, gotcha. But also Witness to 9-11, uh, phone calls from the towers. Those are all really good ones. Oof. Mm. Brutal. Brutal. And then there's the People magazine that they have kind of like a. A spread there, like a centerfold, but it's the towers and the smoke. You see that? Towers yeah. with their titties out. <laughs> like why did centerfold. they? Why did they make that into a two page? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you only really need the one page there. Yeah, look what people was wearing, or look what the night the towers were wearing. That yeah, day or like, who are you wearing? <laughs> yeah, I don't know because they have nothing else. There's no advertising. Imagine what are you gonna put the Marlboro cigarette on the other side and just like make it look like one long seat? Like you can't, well, you I can't don't know. advertise yeah. on that at all. So they might as well use all the space. Yeah, there's a lot of smoke to cover. Yeah, with the, with the smoke, there's fire. Okay, so famous casualties, and if you see our title here, R I P, but I made the letter I look like the Twin Towers. Yeah, yeah. Is a tribute. So it's R I I P. Well, it looks like a sequel to a movie that the acronym is RP. RP2. RP2. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it looks like, guys. But, but in a good way. Ron Paul 2. <laughs> yeah. You thought the first one was bad enough. The Awakening. Yeah. Ron Paul. <laughs> he, we Rand rise Paul. from the ashes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's talk Horrible. about. Let's talk about Barbara Olson. She was a conservative author and pundit. And she was on Flight 77 to L.A. to film an episode of Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher. I remember. New rule. Don't fly on 9-11, okay? <laughs> if you're going to fly, don't fly on 9-11. 2001. <laughs> 2002, that's fine. <laughs> if you ever want to get booked on my show, don't do it, Okay. <laughs> She was married to Ted Olson, who was the Solicitor General at the time, and they were considered a Washington power couple. And so let's hear a little from her, okay? I remember her. I remember um, her on CNN. I, I was not a fan of Politically Incorrect yet, because it's funny, because how he, this happens and he stops having this show is very 9-11 related. Yeah, and that is coming up, too. Go ahead. She investigated Travelgate for Congress, and her book is Hell to Pay, the unfolding story of Hillary Rodham Clinton. Barbara Olson, Barbara. Hey, how are you? Thank you for coming back. There you go. Sorry. There it is. There's her book. So this is her on C-SPAN two days before 9-11. Damn. Barbara Olson, this month's edition of The Washingtonian has a story. It's called The 100 Most Powerful Women, and in it... Girls Rule is the name of the article. Why are you listed as an influential political insider? I don't know. I mean, what does it mean to have influence? I don't know. I get up really early and I work all day and go to home really late. Does that mean influence? All right. And so then that's Barbara Olson. You know, very sad. R.I.P. Yeah. And then we got David Angel, creator of Fraser and Wings. Wings, based on Martha's Vineyard, mm. Massachusetts. Also where, produced Cheers. Where JFK yeah. Jr. died in a plane also on Martha's Vineyard on the way there. Yeah. Before 9-11. Pre-9-11, 1999. Yeah, a lot of <laughs> a lot of things go went down in 1999 as we've talked about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm saying he's still alive and part of the QAnon. <laughs> <laughs> David Angel died on Flight 11. He was returning from a vacation in Cape Cod. And then I have a clip. And in this clip, first of all, it starts out with Kelsey Grammer at the Heroes Telethon or whatever. Do you remember that? Where they had like every celebrity in the world there. Oh my God. Yeah. The oh, it's who, when they had the, the who concert. was there. Yeah. The yeah. Who, what, Bruce Springsteen was crying. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And so yeah. Kelsey Grammer, you know, because he was affiliated with Fraser and David Angel. And then afterwards, after that clip, there's a curious, there were, there's some conspiracy theorists who think there were weird signs in Wings and Fraser that warned us about 9 11. Yes. Oh, God. Fucking people. I mean, that some of them are our listeners, and we just got to tell you. <laughs> yeah. We like it when you do it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. You Patreon us. But, That's what we had to do. But tell those you. other wings. We guys, like it when yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah. Those other truthers, you know, aluminum hat uh, maniacs. We don't like those people. And check out who this first celebrity is here on the phone. Who? Ooh, got a, a big building, and I'm going to stick a plane right up it. <laughs> <laughs> I need a lot of money today. <laughs> Some survivors, okay? In times like these, we can find comfort and inspiration in the words of past American heroes. Did you have to check this message? No. Okay, so now this is the clip from Fraser. All right, don't touch that thing. Hi, it's Laura. We're getting an extra day of rehearsal, so I'm coming in tonight instead of tomorrow. American Flight 11, 1030. Can't wait. Oh, Bye. wow. Great news. Laura's in town. That's Who's one Laura? of the flights and Stranger the times of the machine, towers man. falling down. Am I the only one in this household that checks this machine? Hi, Molly. Laura again. Again? So, anyway, I can't wait to see you guys. I've been on my own way too much lately. See you at 1030, Flight 11. Love you. Bye. Well, Cessna 402 is one of the safest this aircraft in the sky today. God. I told you that, the salesman. <laughs> Fraser, stop being such a baby. If we crash and die, we crash and die. This is a vacation, for God's sakes. And it goes on and on. Nice. Nice. All right, so I don't know what it all means, but R.I.P. David Angel. Yeah. Yeah. And the next one here we got is Angel Huarbe Jr., he was the winner of the Fox reality series Murder in Small Town X. It was a reality competition where there was a faux murder that they had to solve. He won it, and the series finale aired on September 4th, 2001. He was a firefighter, part of Ladder 12, and he died in the North Tower. Man. And I have a clip of the finale of Murder in Small Town See, X. this guy's a real hero here. Yeah. A real hero, yes. Congratulations. Get over here. I'll give you that. I'll give you that hug. In the end, it's funny because yeah. I felt that Jeff had the last word. And after what we had gone through, I really didn't want to give him the last word. I don't really feel like I lost anything. I'll take second place to a guy like Angel any time. I did it. I know what it's like to uh, turn on the television. I know what it's like to become a TV detective. Congratulations, Angel. Thank you very You've much. You solved this murder and apprehended the killer. In appreciation, the town of Sunrise would like to present you with a check for $250,000 and the keys to a new 2002 Jeep Liberty Sport. It was a lot of fun, but I'm a firefighter, not an investigator. I tip my hat to those guys who do that for a living. That gives me the chills. Wait, so yeah. was that like a fake murder? Yeah. Or a real murder? No, it was a fake murder. Oh, it's oh, a reality so. competition. Okay. 250 yeah. grand's great. That's amazing. Yeah. For wow. Fake murder. That's when they really ponied up some real money in these. Send it. <laughs> and his new car, 2002, a year he did not live to see. Jeep Liberty. And he was part. And justice. Oh. Jeep Jeepers Creepers. For all. Yeah, his. Oh, are you saying there's a connection? No, like I'm Liberty, just. Liberty, th- Kyle? <laughs> well, I mean, there's a lot going on in, you know, the Jeep Liberty, American themed, I would guess. Uh huh. Uh, he the, was also part of the hunky fireman calendar. There you go. Yeah. The Patriots won the Super Bowl. All right. Well, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, this guy. Not even trying to. This is, you know, what a guy. What a hero. Yeah, what a guy. That's great guy. Damn. And the great camaraderie on this show, too. They seem to really get, uh, you know, enjoy each other. And that it yeah. aired on September 4th. That finale. On Fox. Crazy. <laughs> I don't know what the Fox part means, but... I don't know. Either. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Fox is involved uh, with other people involved in 9-11. Yes. Okay. Thank All you. right. I'll take it. Foreshadowing. Right. We got Barry Berenson here. BB. She was actress, model, and widow to Anthony Perkins. Wow. And I don't want to be disrespectful here. Everyone's doing their own thing, but Anthony Perkins was famously... 
a homosexual, as they said in yeah. his time. Yes. And he died of AIDS, but he married her in the 70s, and they had, by all accounts, a very happy marriage with children. Yeah. So it's just an interesting kind of Hollywood couple there. Yeah. Well, it's a guy, for, actor from Psycho. Yeah, exactly. Anthony Perkins. I mean, this guy dated Tab Hunter. He was he dated exclusively men until marrying her out of the blue. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was the opposite. I thought he was married and then it came out. There. No. Oh, it's quite the wow. Quite the opposite. That's crazy. Yeah, he settled down, but of course, you know, he had AIDS. Mm. So yeah, you know, that's a time tragic family there. You know, like, very tragic. Yeah, but you know, and I always see the bright side. They had a nice house on Cape Cod. <laughs> they did. <Nope>. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> she was returning from Cape Cod, just like. David Angel, and they were on the same flight, Flight 11. Yeah. Man. But me and Mark are both from Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. We've both gone to Cape Cod a million times. Uh, I don't know if I was super rich and famous that I would ever go there again. Never mind fly across the country. I mean, Cape Cod's okay, mm -hmm. but you could go to Cabo. You could go anywhere else. Okay. It's like, eh, I don't know if I want to go to Cape Cod. I, I'm going to disagree with you here. I, really? I actually, I, I would, if I had real money, I'd go to Martha's Vineyard. Let's be honest here. Because, uh, you know, no, no no shenanigans goes down there. Cape Cod, there's people like, you know, this this fight, this like, gang fights going on. Yeah, there. even more so Nantucket. There's no room. Nantucket, right yeah, there. there's no, they don't even, oh, let, of course. they don't even let you off the boat there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is, a, they say, turn it around. Uh, hey, Red look Sox at it. Hat. Yeah, <laughs> this turn is, it around, Patriots, uh, Tom Brady jersey. <laughs> fascinating discussion here. Yeah. But I'm going to play a clip of Elvis Perkins, Barry Berenson's son. Also, the son of Anthony Perkins. And here's him talking about his mom on CBS this morning. All right. Have you been down to the memorial? I have. How did you feel seeing it? There's, it, it it's not for me. It isn't? No, I don't, feel like the, I don't feel like she's there. No, and when I'm there, I don't really feel like I'm there. And to tell you the, the truth, my, f my first impression was, wow, that's a lot of water they're using. Do we, do we need, is that necessary? Yeah. I, I don't feel the spirit there. But you feel the spirit in your music? I do, yeah, and just about anywhere else. <laughs> 20 years later, where are you with all this? You know, I'm, uh, I'm in the celebration of her existence. She lived a fabulous life, and she lived it fabulously. There you go. For sure. Interesting family. Okay, so the, the next portion here, we have uh, celebrity near misses, people who almost or probably should have died on 9-11 that did not, by the grace of whatever you believe in. Thank goodness. Yeah. By the grace of Allah. By the grace of <laughs> alcohol, perfect timing, uh, multiple things. But mm -hmm. the first one that we have is Mr. Michael LaMonaco. He was a celebrity chef, and he was the head chef at the top of the North Tower in this restaurant called Windows of the World. On the world. Windows on the world. Because it looks like you're looking... At the top of the world. That is true. Uh, yeah, so big celebrity chef. He actually got to work early that day. Um, so a lot of people, you know, that we're talking about either didn't make a flight or they didn't make it to a meeting in the Twin Towers. This man was in the Twin Towers when this happened. Can I? Can you say, like, there is something to the fact of the slackers, you know, the people <laughs> that don't show up to work on time. I'm not mm -hmm. saying they, they're better people or they're better off but you know it's just like this is just chance luck you yeah know, chance luck or bad luck and just you know crossing the street anything could happen mm -hmm. if you're on time or you're late it doesn't matter you can you can get killed either way so it's just it's just the weirdness of chance in life so mr lamonico chef he uh he got to work too early so he's like oh i actually have some time to go to lens crafters and fix my glasses that are broken and while he was there getting everything fixed, um, one of the planes hit the fucking tower. So he's like, okay, I'm not going up now. And literally escaped death by showing up too early and running an errand before he actually checked in for work. Yeah. And the sad thing is he knew that other people were up there setting up the kitchen. So, you know, that was another reason why he didn't, he, he didn't care about being the first person up there because he knew things were getting taken care of already. Mm-hmm. And he just very luckily had his glasses broken and needed it fixed. Mm -hmm. And as that was happening, 
the first plane hit. And Windows on the World has always fascinated me because these are the people that were waving the white napkins. And the, oh, is that true? Out like, of the window? Yeah, and these are a lot out of out of the, the window of the world. <laughs> these are a lot of the jumpers, Oof. and that's the subject of the falling man that I already mentioned. He worked at Windows on the World. Oh, he did. Oh yes. my god! And so everybody that was there, just having a nice breakfast with a beautiful view, they were hundred percent going to die. Oh. And I just can't even imagine that mixture of. I mean, this is always the thing about life and death, right? Like the idea of you're happy one second and then the next second you're dead. Yeah, anything can happen at any time. Yeah, so, it, yeah, crazy. Good or bad, that's the interesting thing about it. It's yeah. just like the crazy mm-hmm. enough to, uh, chance of life. Yeah, so luckily he was spared and God, literally just by <laughs> getting his glasses fixed. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely insane. Seth MacFarlane had uh, a number of things go wrong for him that ended up going right for him. He uh, he was flying from Boston to L.A. Uh, because he was, on September 10th, he did a speech at his alma mater in Rhode Island, mm-hmm. uh, which... RISD was uh, the school. Was it RISD? Yeah, he went to RISD, which is Rhode Island School of Design, which also Charles Rocket, Charles Rocket mm-hmm. went to. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I... I, I, I could tell because he had a good friend group down there. He actually named the production company of his uh, production company called Fuzzy Door. That was named from a fuzzy door that they had uh, at his RISD apartment, actually, with oh, his no way. friends. Yeah. And so that that group he had was like a core group of like very, I'm sure, talented people that, you know, I'm sure they had a couple of whiskeys, you know, had yeah. some talked about the old times and talked about that stupid security guard that they had who... Uh, Seth, you know, based the Peter Griffin character on. Yeah. And yeah, so he got wicked hung over that night. <laughs> and yeah, he had more than a few. So that is the story that made the news, which is true. He ended up being super hung over that morning. And people blame that on the reason for him being late. But I actually found out recently that it's not the exact reason why he was late. It was because his travel agent gave him a time that was 30 minutes late. So he ended up missing the boarding by 15 minutes. Yeah. So he was 15 minutes from death, not knowing it. The crazy thing with him is that, like, yes, of course, Family Guy was popular at this time. Uh, Shortly after, it got canceled. um, And it wasn't until I think I was in college and the DVD sales were doing so well Mm -hmm. that they were like, okay, we're bringing you back because people are actually, you know, want to see this. They're spending tons of money. Why wouldn't they watch it on TV? And he got a $100 million contract after almost dying on 9-11. So he went from almost dying in a terrorist attack to having his show canceled and then brought back due to DVD sales and becoming a multi, multi, multi millionaire. And here's Seth talking about his experience on an Australian talk show. I was booked on the first flight that hit the tower and and, uh, I was was drinking the night before. Uh, Overslept a little bit. Uh, in conjunction with the fact that my travel agent uh, screwed up the the itinerary by about 15 minutes, and so I arrived 10 minutes late to get on the flight. Otherwise, you would have been, been on the drinking ever since. Exactly. Yeah. That was the <laughs> exactly, Lauren. Cheers to that. <laughs> Cheers to all. We'll have a break. We'll be right back after this. Yeah. Hey, I'll Cheers drink to that too. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations on Family survival, Guy. Yeah, and everything. Survival, living. They say drink it'll kill you. Yeah. But it saved me from Mohammed Atta. Yeah. <laughs> and then what did Family Guy do with 9-11, you might be asking to yourself? I have the answer to that. Peter, you do realize there's a difference between loving America and being swept up in post-9-11 paranoia. Brian, are you suggesting that 9-11 didn't change everything? What? No, I was just... Uh... Because 9-11 changed everything, Brian. 9-11 changed everything. Peter, you didn't even know what 9-11 was until 2004. That's not true, Brian. I remember 9-11. <laughs> Must have been a woman pilot, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Lois is crying. Oh, smack. Yeah. Well, the, the other side of that, his story was when he went to uh, the airport, he decided to just wait around for the next flight to go from, from Boston to Los Angeles. And he fell asleep. He took a long nap. And when he woke up... The world was on fire. The world was on fire. <laughs> and the bartender at, like, the United, like, you know... 
whatever like uh, the, the, uh, the, cl- the whatever club you first like, class lounge first class lounge uh, just said let me buy you a drink buddy wow and he just uh, served him up a couple of shots on the house and then he's like but the next one's you know you got to pay for it yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay well the next near miss is this is one that I didn't even know like I'm learning a lot about you know certain stories and this is one completely new to me <laughs> 20, 22 years later yeah. Michael Jackson, we already mentioned he was hot off of his performance the night before. Yeah, 30th anniversary tribute show where a whole bunch of celebrities were there, and Patty Davis was one of them who also missed one of the flights on 9-11 because it was a two-night affair. One of them was September 7th, I believe. The other one was September 10th. Ended up being booked on one of the flights that ended up going down during 9-11, and uh, she had just gotten switched to the first one so just got off that flight and was able to go home early so luckily wow. she was able to get out of it too michael jackson had uh either a meeting or a performance inside of the world trade center that morning and he had spoken to his mother on the phone for too long he was too tired overslept didn't make it he wakes up twin towers are on the ground Michael Jackson was he well, on the, was was he he on the propofol yeah no, i was just going to ask that <laughs> well, question <laughs> probably yeah. Was was Conrad Murray in the situation already? <laughs> you would have to guess. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. would have to guess. That is, uh, you know, he blames it on talking to his mom on the phone for too long, but it's probably the propofol. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Conrad Murray is basically Tower 10 to Michael Jackson. Yeah, it was the propa rise before the propa fall. Hee <laughs> 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 Pupper rise comes before the fall. <laughs> yeah. the fall. And our final near miss here is... One of our favorite subjects here. I gotta, I gotta get my laptop for this <laughs> one because I got some deets. How's your mother? I got some tea. How's your mother doing? Yeah, Marky Mark. Yeah, Mark Wahlberg was supposed to be on the same flight as Seth MacFarlane's uh, Flight Eleven, wow. the one that went into the North Tower at eight forty-six a.m. Mm-hmm. Flown okay. by none other than Muhammad Atta. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but you know, did it all have to go down that way? No. One, what could have changed the situation? Mark Wahlberg could have changed it. How you like me now? How you like me now? <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Well, tell I, us about it. Everyone, you would have been slapping him in the face with some Wahlburgers. I think now it's it's in the uh, it's in pop culture now that clearly you know anything you say or if Mark Wahlberg was in you know you know at Jer- that Jersey Mike's the sandwich wouldn't have been that bad you know stuff like yeah. that uh, and that's kind of his claim to fame so. What is the actual quote versus what people think just happened? So this is uh, in January 2012, while he was promoting the movie Contraband, he did a little interview for Men's Journal magazine in which he said, if I was on the plane with my kids, I wouldn't have it wouldn't have went down like it did. And there would have been a lot of blood in the first class cabin. I like that he he likes to mention that he's in first class. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No um, blood would be spilled in, you know, economy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no business class for me. There's no blood there. Yeah. yeah. Comfort plus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, no a lot of blood would have been spilled in first class cabin. And then me saying, Okay, we're going to land somewhere safely. Don't worry. We're landing on the top of the tower. <laughs> yeah, we're, <laughs> we're landing at Wahlburgers yeah. in fucking Hanover. <laughs> and a lot of blood. <laughs> Wouldn't you assume that he would be strangling them or something? Like how, where's the blood coming from? Yeah. Well, does he does beating he, them to a pulp? Yeah, oh, I okay. guess so. Just with his fists, with his bare Boston hands. Yeah, with these fucking Dorchester hands, Just these wrap, Dorchester mitts. Wrap my Calvin Klein thighs around their neck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pop their head off. Yeah, with these glamour muscles that don't do much. Yeah, <laughs> would have been a sea of blood. Yeah, or red wine, as Ashton Kutcher calls it. Yeah. yeah, and I think the whole country collectively rolled their eyes, and also there were survivors of. Uh, 9-11 plus um, widows of victims and, you know, people who actually knew people who died in 9-11 that were like, this is disgusting that you would even think you could do something more than our family could do. But that wasn't the first time that he mentioned this. He had mentioned it in 2006 in another uh, interview where he said, we certainly w- would have tried to do something to fight. I probably had over 50 dreams about it. 50 dreams? 
<laughs> That's such a specific number. He wakes up. He's like, man, is that, was that 49? Let me yeah. at him. Yeah. <laughs> Episode 50. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, hello, people did fight back, and that's why they en- ended up crashing in Shanksville. Like, that is the story of the flight. There was a fight, and uh, Paul Greengrass directed the movie. Yeah. United 93. They, there was a bunch of people that stormed, and they were, like, ex-military mm-hmm. on the plane. Like, you think you're better than that, dude? Because you were in Transformers? No, does he think he would have taken over that plane? Not only that, flown to where the other planes were and stopped them. Too. Yeah. And jumped out, jumped into those planes. Yeah, and stopped them. <laughs> yeah, we all needed Marky Mark to be our hero, the guy that just starred in Planet of the Apes. Yeah, yeah. the bad one with Michael Jackson <laughs> yeah, ape in it. You don't want to star in the bad Planet <laughs> of the Apes. You know what he had in the canon too? The Truth About Charlie, one of the oh, worst God. movies ever made. Yeah, but I forgot about that. With, movie. with the, one of the best filmmakers, uh, Jonathan Demme. Yes, we've got rest in peace. Rest in peace. Also, right. uncle of Ted Demme, who we did an episode. Yeah, about. Silence yeah. of the Lambs. Philadelphia. Yeah. And then, but Mark Wahlberg's mentality, it's like Trump saying, only losers die. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's what he said, uh, Trump said about gold star military people. Yeah. Or uh, John McCain, he's like, only losers get captured. Yes, exactly. And he's called, he basically called John McCain a rat. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's ridiculous. Stupid. Um, but Mark Wahlberg was supposed to be on flight 11, as I said. But he, him and his his entourage. It was this is probably around the time, the show Entourage was inspired, which mm-hmm. you know I wouldn't really brag about. But it, it was uh, him. They went to the um, Toronto Film Festival. I think it's called TIFF. Uh, they went to that instead. They, uh, they decided, like I think a week before, to go to that uh, festival, and then they went on to L.A. from there. But yeah. he was booked on that flight at one time. He was a, with E and drama could have been in. Yeah, Turtle. You know, yeah. Turtle would have stopped everything. I believe that. <laughs> yeah, Turtle with his, <laughs> with his FUBU like <laughs> sweatsuit or something. <laughs> uh, other notables, Jackie Chan, which I'm just finding out about, he was set to film a stunt at the top of the World Trade Center on the morning of 9-11. At 7 a.m., production was supposed to start. He was supposed to be a window washer for the film Nosebleeds. And instead, uh, he was rerouted to Canada to film something else when the stunt was canceled. So it was canceled before. I think they said it might have been a week, could have been a month, but he was supposed to be. He was scheduled to be there. Wasn't nosebleeds about a window washer for the World Trade Center? Yes. Yeah, he was oh going to be the God. window washer. So mm. the movie. I Imagine have- if he was there and he stopped up. He blocked it. <laughs> he fucking did one of these. That's a Family Guy <laughs> sketch. <right? laughs> Another notable, uh, Gabori Sidibe, who is famous for playing Precious. <laughs> Gabori Sidibe. All right, you say the name then, because I don't know. Right. What's her name, Alejandro? Gabore Sidibe. Gabore Sidibe, who is famous for playing Precious. Uh, she... Based on the novel Push by Sapphire. And there you go. The official title. She <laughs> was a student at the borough of Manhattan Community College. Uh, she also said she slept in, which did not happen often. So if that's the case, good. She ended up missing a class and debris from the World Trade Center fell into the building her class was scheduled in and killed professors and students that were there what? that morning. What? Yes. Yeah. No, I've never heard that. I didn't either. This is w- another one that I'm learning. Huh. Ian Thorpe, who had previously... Jordan Peterson is like, good. Yeah. <laughs> Clean your room. Clean your room. Clean your 9-11. <laughs> Clean the ground zero. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I'm having a 9-11 themed drink right now. This is the ground Zima. Oh, boy. Oh I did want to say, though, that Mark Wahlberg did issue an apology. He did agree that it was ridiculous that he would have... His yeah. crisis management team stepped in and made him apologize, and then they wiped that interview clean from yes. the Yes, for the record, he for the not record, he did actually have that Men's Journal uh, article and interview totally scrubbed from the internet. There's just like reaction articles to it at yeah. this point on the internet. And yeah. you didn't read the whole quote. He actually elaborated and said he would have beat up those hijackers and blinded them like he did old Asian guys. Oh, boy. Oh, my God. Fast fake facts with Alejandro. I was wondering, like, did I miss something or is Alejandro just riffing? Yeah. Another crazy story, Ian Thorpe, who was like the Michael Phelps of this time. He was 18, 19 years old. He had just won a bunch of medals at the Sydney Olympics for swimming. Uh, He was out for a run in Manhattan. 
he was staying in a hotel and he's like da 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 running down the street you know like Forrest Gump yeah yeah and he sees like oh man I'm close to the Twin Towers I gotta go back to my hotel and get my camera so I can take a picture of the Twin Towers goes back runs to his hotel and when he gets back to his hotel room he sees that planes just hit the World Trade Center in the time that it took him from to see it to go back mm. and so he was like I'm not going back there smart yeah uh, Sarah Ferguson who is the Duchess of York Fergie. Uh, yeah, the first Fergalicious. She was who doesn't piss herself. Her interview got As, that we know of. She might have on nine eleven. Uh, As she, we all did. She was interviewed. Her interview was later than it was scheduled for at Good Morning America, and she did not make her meeting at the World Trade Centers, which was supposed to you know be there. Wow. So she missed out, and uh, <laughs> yeah, she missed out on all the fun. That and her her brother was actually downtown at uh, Jeffrey Epstein's house. That's right. Her. Yeah. Wasn't she married to Philip? Andrew? Andrew, yeah, that's right. Andrew, I think, yeah. Maybe that was it was her husband. Who knows? Well, yeah, Either they, way, they were both involved, but yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, so those are the celebrities. Yeah, where was Epstein? She that was, day. Sarah was holding the camera. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Epstein was calling the plays that day. That's where he was. Yeah. Yeah, why couldn't Epstein have been on flight eleven? <laughs> yeah, uh, because he was orchestrating the whole thing. That's true. Right. <laughs> New theory. Hot theory. He was in Tower, you know, 13, the one they never talk about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, post 9 11 Hollywood, we got patriotic songs like Lee Greenwood's God Bless the USA. I'm proud to be an American. Well, at least I, I know, know I'm, I'm free. free. They play that on the loudspeaker at my high school that week. We Are you free? New rule. Okay. New rule. <laughs> You better be free now. You're not free, but you, you feel like it. <laughs> New rule. I was in chorus in 2001, and they made us sing this song, and we had like a concert, and everybody cried. In Weymouth? Yeah. You were in chorus in Weymouth? I got kicked out because I made I people you were laugh say, too much. Yeah. Well, you made what? I made people laugh too much. Okay. Yeah. My I thought you were going to say like they kicked your head in or something for being <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. in chorus. <laughs> yeah, chorus really roughed me up. Yeah. That they they beat you out of it if you wanted to leave. Yeah, it's like a gang. Yeah, they jump you in and jump you out. <laughs> he said you were too funny, Morris. <laughs> yeah, this guy's too funny. Yeah, let's beat him out of it. Yeah, <laughs> and that's what they'll say on Kyle's biography. He was too funny. <laughs> yeah, to live. But after this, there's so many insane songs. Like, of course, we had all the patriotic ones. The ones that are crazy to me are the ones that were actually banned from Clear Channel for playing on the radio. Okay, what are some of those? Uh, Three Doors Down, Duck and Run. That makes sense. Uh, 311's Down. That was banned, though, before 9-11. Why? No, I'm just kidding. Because it's so <laughs> it 311. Yeah. Yeah. Same 311 with <laughs> is my 911. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Same it, with all Limp Biscuits catalog. Yeah. <laughs> ACDC had a number of them, but uh, Highway to Hell, Safe in New York City, Shoot to Thrill, Shot Down in Flames were all banned. Uh, Louis Armstrong's What a Wonderful World. What? Alien Ant Farm, Smooth Criminal. But that was. A big hit at the time. It's like anything that reminded you, anything that said down, falling, rescue, sabotage, Beastie Boys sabotage was gone, sure shot. Anything that was like somewhat could have had a double entendre. Things got weird after this time. It was super weird. Yeah, the yeah. FCC just got out of control. It was Colin, Paul, Colin Powell's son was actually the head of the FCC. I'm, I'm in the uh, FCC, and he just got read, in, which led to Family Guy doing fuck the FCC. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, and J Lo had a band song. It was called Tower Three Go Boom Boom. Jesus, we got Alejandro's got them all locked and loaded today. Oh, he can't say locked and loaded today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Foo Fighters learn to fly. Like, oh come anything on, anything that says fly. He can't say learn to crash. John Mellencamp. Well, they, did, they didn't learn to land, though. The, yeah. the, the, those hijackers, remember that? <laughs> and their lesser-known song, Teach Muhammad Atta to Fly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Even leaving on a jet plane is banned at this time. <laughs> well, of course it is, Kyle. P.O.D.'s, Here Comes the Boom. You and John I'm Denver's lesser-known song, Leaving on Flight 11. Rage Against the Machine, though? All songs from their catalog. Yeah. All of them. I do what are you going to do? Play Rage Against the Machine. I do remember this. Remember 94.5 in Boston? Jammin'. Jammin' 94.5. They played uh, Notorious B.I.G. 
uh, juicy. And then he, uh, there's a lyric. He goes, "Blow up the, like the World Trade." They just x. They just x. They would that bleep out. that out. Yeah, but they still play the song. Yeah, they might even play it. Blow up like the sh- <laughs> <laughs> downtown Boston. Yeah, <laughs> but Toby Keith, they played. <laughs> I mean, he had a song like. Fuck them Arabs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he had yeah, put a boot in the ass of the Arabs. <laughs> yeah, like it was right. very specific. Oh, yeah. is he the one that had courtesy of the red, white, and blue? Yeah, I think so. There was a lot of those songs. Like, I'm gonna that stick came my up. boot up your ass. Yeah. Well, it's like it's not even the patriotic songs. It's like everything. They had USA cigarettes that were like randomly made for this. Everyone was buying them. Uh, freedom fries yep. took the place of French fries. That was during more during the Iraq War, though. Yeah, yeah but that, it was that an extension was of nine eleven because yes. because France famously in NATO refused to sign off on the Iraq War. Yeah, which was a ridiculous thing. They couldn't get NATO, I think, to get on board with it, which was a made up war. And as Michael Moore said, it's a fictitious war by a fictitious president. Yes, yeah. um, but you know, after a week or so. Comedy entertainment started coming back. Um, First, I want to mention um, Bono. And then there were the tributes that got a lot of attention. And probably the most notable one is the Super Bowl 2002, when Bono lifted his jacket and revealed the American flag. Oh. Yeah. I He did that when I, I saw him. And um, I couldn't see the Boston show, which they taped and they put they put a nationally on VH1. But I did go to the Providence show the night after that, uh, which is like the lesser show. Uh, yeah. But he still did the same thing, and it, he blew the doors off the place. It was amazing. He did all the all the names also, and he played Martin Luther King, and it, uh, yeah. it was amazing. All right, well, yeah, Bono, thank you. Six days after 9-11, yeah. the Yankees came out, and that's when everyone was like, all right, let's go back to normal and mm-hmm. see baseball again and see you know whatever entertainment has for us. Again, and it kind of galvanized everybody. It, people were actually rooting for the Yankees, which is one of the most fucking hated teams of all time. But they were like, let's go, New York. Against the Arizona Diamondback? Uh, I believe so, yes. Yeah. I remember Rudy Giuliani, who was one <laughs> li- well like person throughout the first pitch. Yeah, George Bush was thrown out the first pitch. Oh, George Bush threw out the yeah, first pitch. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. another inconceivable notion that Giuliani was sympathetic, that he was a hero. He wasn't a hero, actually. He, no, but he that's fucked his, everything up. That's what his perception was. That was Everyone loved persona. him at that yeah, point. At yeah, at that time, you had to be on board with these people because we were a country on a, at attack. Yeah. On attack. And he showed up on SNL the first uh, episode back with the firefighters. Yeah. yeah. And Kyle, so you mentioned the late night return. So this was huge. Yeah. About a week after 9-11, the... Julian is like, we need you to all come back and do comedy because that will help us all heal. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a big deal late night coming back. And I have a little compilation here. And do you see this picture? Do you all remember this moment? It's David Letterman. He was the first one back. Yeah. He was the tester. You know, what do you call it? The the canary in the coal mine or the, the litmus test? Exactly. And Dan Rather was his guest, and they held hands and cried together. Yeah. And everyone thought that was a great moment. And that is in this montage that we were about to watch. This is our uh, first show back on the air since the tragic events last week. Uh, very early on, Uh, After the attack, and how strange does it uh, sound to invoke that phrase, after the attack, um, Mayor Giuliani encouraged us and here lately implored us to to go back to our lives, go on living, uh, continue trying to make uh, New York City uh, the place that it should be. It's hard to believe nine days ago, the biggest story in the United States, the Barbara Walters special, the cover of the magazine, and hey, she's crazy. Wow. <laughs> that was our biggest problem. Bringing it back. Days ago. You know, when you go, wow, was it really that innocent a time just nine days ago? But, you know, we still have a job to do. And I don't pretend that this is an important job. You know what this job is? This job is like a cookie to those firemen. That's what we do. I like what? He, he, he throws and hates under the bus. <laughs> he doesn't survive. Same. How rude. Yeah. This show is like a cookie to the firemen? What? 
Hey, Kevin, remember when we were innocent and we hey. could pick on Anne Hayes? Hey, Kevin, you fun? get this analogy? <laughs> it's like a sweet little treat. <laughs> <laughs> we're like a cookie, you know what I mean? Yeah, you who? watch, it'll give you cavities. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is making sense to you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe. <laughs> maybe. I said, maybe, look at the plane they're going in the dough. I feel bad for those firefighters. It's going to be a few years before I burn myself. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you think I put my faith to the fires? <laughs> yeah. I told them, he's, yeah. I don't care what happens. I'm not leaving. <laughs> and not every late night host was welcomed back with grace. The open chins? <laughs> with Yeah, with open arms, I was trying to think of. <laughs> we all remember what happened to Bill Maher. On his first show back on 9-17-2001, he said this. We have been the cowards, lobbing cruise missiles from 2,000 miles away. Absolutely. That's cowardly. That, that is a Staying family. in the airplane yes. when it hits the building. That is Say a what family. you want Shut about it. Shut the fuck cowardly. up. So he said staying in the plane, crashing into the building, that's not cowardly. Yeah, kamikazes are a little not cowardly compared to, you know... He's but hold a, on. He's a union buster, this guy. He doesn't care about anyone besides himself. He said that because his guest, Dinesh D'Souza, who directed the movie 2016 Obama's America, by the way. And 2,700 mules, which actually tried to debunk Biden winning the election in 2020. Oh, okay. Yeah, so he makes all those political movies. <laughs> yeah, but which are like, you know, bullshit. So he was the guest that day, 9-1701, and he had brought up the subject first, saying they're not cowardly. But then Bill Maher took it a step further, saying, we're the cowards. And he claims he wasn't talking about the military because he's used the word where. And he's like, I'm not in the military. And oh, so he's a coward? Yeah, he's basically saying uh, the country or something. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So the show pretty Bill, much died Bill, Bill after Barr that. Talks out of his ass. He doesn't even know what he's saying half the time. Yeah. So that was the d death nail in that show. He by summer it was gone, and then oh, he no. went on to do real time on HBO. New rule. Yeah. Give credit to the terrorists, okay? <laughs> and I'm here's pro terrorist now, okay? Here's what Howard Stern had to say to him. Rock. The guy's off his fucking rocker. He gets on the air, and what does he have to say? He turns to the camera and he goes, boy, those guys aren't cowards. Why don't you go move to fucking Iran if you feel that way? They've since made up. Hey, I got his back on that statement. Yeah, I don't care. Yeah, Howard was very strident at that time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Granted, the Iraq war killed a lot of innocent people. Yeah. Howard also said he wanted to nuke everywhere in the Middle East. Yeah. Who doesn't matter who was in on it or who wasn't. So that tells you like the the temperature of the place. Well Howard Stern in media, private parts, he was standing between the Twin Towers, wasn't he? That's true. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah, his dick was the tower was the tower build, seven. Building seven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was the, the one car, right in the corner. The car next to Tower yeah. Seven. <laughs> the Toyota Corolla next to Tower yeah. Seven was Howard's his tiny ween as he calls it. Yeah, so Bill Maher was in hot water, but he's since cooled it down. Why does he look older then than he does now? Yeah, because he's got like, you know, he just spray paints yeah. his face. Yeah, he's got more money now. He's got the adrenochrome. Yeah, probably. And Kyle, can you open up this link from Elizabeth Wurzel? So the author of the book Prozac Nation, which was a big hit at the time, for some reason she did an interview with the Toronto Globe in February 2002, and here's what she had to say. Quote, I had not the slightest emotional reaction. I thought, this is a really strange art project. It was the most amazing sight in terms of sheer elegance. It felt like water. It just slid like a turtleneck going over someone's head. She added, I just felt like everyone was overreacting. People were going on about it. That part really annoyed me. So she was talking about the whole thing, 9-11, watching the Twin Towers fall. And so her movie was canceled. Jason Biggs and Christina Ricci starred in it, and it was shelved. And it eventually was released in 2003 or wow. 2004, a couple of years later. People won't stop bitching about the biggest terror attack in America. Yeah, so a lot of people were getting into hot water. What a fucking psycho. Giving their opinions. Can everyone just calm down and talk about my movie? And then George Carlin, 
had a special planned called I Kind of Like It When a Lot of People Die. This is the craziest one to me. And so he had this all set up, you know, pretty much the title speaks for itself. Yeah. But then 9-11 happens. It was coming out on 9-11. Yeah. Because on Tuesday is when all, like, you know, CDs and uh, everything would come out. But this was going to be his special. Oh, wow. HBO special. So oh, so this video? Filmed and ready to go. It, um, it, it wasn't yet filmed, but he had recorded a performance of it. Yeah, because you know? the CD has yeah, come out. That, yeah. that was, though, much later, just like, this is what it was. Oh. He had, in preparation for his HBO special, had recorded it. Oh, okay. But you're right. It was very close to 9-11. Wow. So then he had to regroup and come up with something else. And so it turned into Complaints and Grievances. Wow. Which aired in November 2001. And then here's a little snippet from that. Now, folks, before we get too far along here tonight, there's something we got to talk about. Everybody knows what it is. It's in the air. It's in the city. And naturally, I'm talking about the events of uh, September 11th and everything that's happened since that time. And the reason we have to talk about it is uh, otherwise, it's like the elephant in the living room that nobody mentions, you know? I mean, yeah, there it is sitting on the fucking couch. Nobody says a word. It's like if you're at a formal garden party and you go over to the punch bowl and you notice that floating around there's a big turd. <laughs> and nobody says a word about it, you know? Nobody says, lovely party, Jeffrey, but there's a turd in the punch bowl. <laughs> so we gotta talk about it, if nothing else, just to get it out of our way so we can have a little fun here tonight. Because otherwise, the terrorists win. <laughs> Don't you love that stuff? Yeah, that's our latest mindless cliche. Go out and buy some jewelry and a new car. Otherwise, the terrorists win. God, I miss that guy. Yeah. So, yeah, it was still a good special, but not as hard-hitting as it could have been. Life is Worth Losing, though, he went on to do yeah. next, and that's great. And then, of course, there was the Hugh Hefner roast. This is the defining moment, I think, when comedy was basically back, in which it was kind of a weird roast in which people were like didn't know how to navigate you know the waters of you know what had just happened and it was really fresh off of 9-11 and then Gilbert Gottfried comes up and just fucking brings the house down and just kind of sets the tone with what allowed us to do this podcast we're doing right now and mm-hmm. I think he just kind of set the guidelines of what you can kind of joke about and basically and anything's on board with 9-11 not to say not everything, but like, you know, not yeah, everything, not everything, but like you can make a lot of jokes about it and it's not above reproach. And so this was taped on September 29th in New York City and it aired in November. And so what didn't air was Gilbert Gottfried's 9-11 joke, which bombed. And that's what led to his infamous telling of the aristocrats. Yep. And we have a clip here. I have to catch a flight to California. I can't get a direct flight. They said they have to stop at the Empire State Building first. That was when the crowd turned. They started booing him. There was a guy in the audience shouting, too soon, too soon. The crowd was murmuring and he said, okay. okay. A man, a, tra- a, a talent agent is sitting in his office. A family walks in. That talent agent goes, what kind of an act do you do? And they suck in and fuck in. And yeah. The aristocrat. Yeah, it's the dirtiest joke of all time. You come up with the most, you know, vile. The situation. mother is fucking the daughter. The daughter <laughs> is fucking the father. The uncle is fucking himself. Yeah. What do you call this thing? The aristocrats. The aristocrat. Mohammed Atta is sucking my balls. Yeah. <laughs> he, and he brought the entire house to his knees and like it it, it took all the air out. it took it like uh mm. the pressure out of the room yeah whatever you call it. it it made everyone feel lighter yeah like oh, okay we needed that we needed a good laugh yeah also the onion did a clever parody what did they say they did a clever satire for 9-11 you see this open here what's that headline i can't read it U.S. vows to defeat whoever it is we're at war with. <laughs> <laughs> and read the one below it. Hijackers surprised to find selves in hell. Because <laughs> <laughs> they were honorable. They yeah. thought. That's the, when the onion was really starting to like, get some movement. And yeah. then the next week there was this headline, which has a picture of Britney Spears with the snake and Gary Condit, that scandal. Oh, uh, sh- yeah, that's old school. 
a shattered nation longs to care about stupid bullshit. Again. <laughs> that was it. Yeah, I mean, that's the truth, though. Uh-huh. And, yeah. you know, this is where they're taking, which I would have never realized until we did the episode on Doug Kenny, but this, they're taking a little bite from uh, National Lampoon's there. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, they carrying the torch. Yeah, yeah. a little in-your-face satire. Yeah, I think they did take over whatever National Lampoon left off because they, they stopped, you know, years and years, in like the mid-'90s or something, actually yeah. publishing something, so... Yeah, I think uh, we were ripe for something like that. Yeah, so we have casualties of Hollywood when it comes to canceled productions. The biggest tragedy of everything. Yeah, Yeah. this is what we're really upset about. Uh, But you don't see these on a plaque. True Lies 2, Forrest Gump 2, and Nosebleed, which is the story of uh, the window washer at the World Trade Centers uh, with Jackie Chan that was going to be up there when the actual planes were going into the World Trade Center, which is insane. Wow. And you wanted to talk about that Friends episode? Yeah, so two weeks after 9-11, Friends aired an episode where they had uh, Monica and Matthew Perry, is that Chandler? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go through TSA, and there was a sign that TSA had posted in the airport that said, uh, no no weapons or bombs and no jokes about bombs. And he's like, listen... I don't have jokes about bombs. I take my bombs very seriously. And they cart him off, and he has to go back, and he's getting you know, detained by TSA. And they finally let him go. They get back through security, and someone calls Monica on her cell phone, being like, hey, should I stay here and wait for you guys? And she's like, no, you should stay there and blow the place up. And then they grab her and drag her off. But they cut all of that from the episode and had to refilm uh, a different scenario for them to be. It was in. a one-hour episode. They were waterboarding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Donald Rumsfeld showed up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so that, not a huge loss to the nation, but yeah. still. Yeah. All right. And then we got some delayed movies. Collateral Damage, Bad Company, Big Trouble, and Gangs of New York. I didn't realize Gangs of New York was pushed back. I, an entire year. Wow. That's Leo DiCaprio and Scorsese, mm-hmm. right? Yep. And... Produced by Harvey Weinstein and financed by Harvey Weinstein. Hey. Whoa. Um, okay. Uh, well, it's true. Moving on. Okay. We've got some edited movies where the Twin Towers have been since taken out. The terrorists have won <laughs> in these scenarios. Uh, the original Spider-Man with uh, Tobey Maguire. Zoolander. And Don't Say a Word. With Brittany Murphy. Yeah. I'll never tell. Hey, I'll never tell you that the Twin Towers ever existed, apparently. <laughs> the Twin Towers were left in Vanilla Sky, City by the Sea, and Donnie Darko. Uh, Yay! Also was left in The Toxic Avenger, but that was from 1980, so... Uh, <laughs> Nobody was watching that one. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I just noticed that last night. I was showing somebody the trailer for, uh, you know, The Toxic Avenger, and they were in there. I was surprised. Nice. Uh, I didn't realize it was a New York movie. Uh, other E.T. re-release turns guns into walkie-talkies with CGI because we can't have violence in this Spielberg world. has since apologized for doing that stupid move. Is that true? That's yeah. true. Yeah. Wow. Um, and we have a couple of clips here that will be of interest. So one movie that did leave the towers in, Mark, <laughs> <laughs> and this is a little video I put no! together. It starts out with someone. But they added more Twin Towers. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Someone was filming, because we just talked about it. We confirmed it was released about a week after 9-11. But the marketing push when Mariah was going crazy, remember that? Where she was exhausted and saying crazy shit. Breaking plates. She was like Tom Cruise at his crazy thing. Everyone everyone has their crazy thing once in a while. Attacking her assistants. I I have a story about her I heard the other night, actually. A a camera guy that, uh, that works on... Um, video shoots uh, said she came in hammered to do this like promo piece with him like he's like the the camera tech guy Mm -hmm. and she was brought in her dogs and she made them wait around for three hours until their dog like make a made a funny face and she was like drunk as a skunk oh yeah 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 anyway go ahead sorry i just want to (laughs) interject come on mimi (laughs) yeah (laughs) have some agua fria the legend of mimi yeah the you know Okay, so someone had filmed one of the posters for Glitter in New York City, and look what they pan up to. (laughs) 
if you're just listening, it's the poster of glitter and then the World Trade Center burning. Two of the towers already burning, yeah. So yeah. three disasters in, in that one, video. Yeah. Three American tragedies. Two, and, two cheeks? On two one towers. block. Yeah. And then here's a clip from the movie where you can just see the Twin Towers that were left in. And apparently audiences <laughs> applauded when they saw them <laughs> in the theater. And it's the only moment anybody liked in the movie. Yeah. And then here again, another shot of the towers near the end. Yeah. So that was the bright spot in Glitter. Wow. And then here's Zoolander removed digitally the towers. And it has since been restored. Making you an offer you won't believe. You Just to get, get people not here. to think of bad things. Mugatu. Well, to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a weird thing, a, the psychological reason basically that it Ground would trigger people here. it's like regis <laughs> philbin trying to move on while he's watching the trade centers get hit with planes like oh what are you doing today yeah let's <laughs> let's do this next bit that we pre-wrote yeah you want to go see glitter yeah, yeah. i told my wife this <laughs> and then we have here the infamous teaser trailer which was since pulled of spider-man this this is the trailer that played in theaters right before 9-11 to promote the 2002 release of Spider-Man, the first one with Spider Tobey Man, Maguire. Spider-Man. Star of Joey Diaz, cocksucker. <laughs> Wait, what? He's one of the people on the train. <laughs> oh, is he? <laughs> I'm something of a hijacker myself. <laughs> So the bad guys are in a helicopter being pulled by the Spidey I web. I forgot about this. This is Sam Raimi. They're stuck between the towers. Yeah, in a spider web between the twin towers. I forgot about that. It's eerie, actually, when it pulls out to show them. Because this is so close. This was still airing when 9-11 happened. Man. Wow. Also, one of the biggest openings of movies. Yeah. Right? And the start of the superhero craze. Yeah, this is when superhero movies started becoming decent. That's a good yeah. point, because this is before Iron Man, right? Oh, way before, yeah. And that 90s oh, music, like before. Chemical Brothers playing. Spider-Man. Someone on YouTube wrote... Dude, I'm hyped for a movie that was released 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's a, the, a picture of E.T. On the left, there's the walkie-talkies, and on the right, there's the original with the gun. Oh, like the shotgun? is. Yeah. Not, oh, my God. That's how paranoid everybody was. They thought they had the sanitizer. It was like taking a rag with some bleach on movies. <laughs> like, how do we fix this oh. so people aren't uncomfortable? And then um, some movies with 9-11 themes since then in the wake of this. 25th Hour, which is amazing. Spike Lee, Philip Seymour Hoffman gives a great performance. Great um, movie. Um, Brian Cox as well. And then we got United 93, which we mentioned. Uh, and then World Trade Center, made by Oliver Stone. And I think everybody was waiting for the moment where Nicolas Cage was having cocaine-fueled sex with a guy wearing a powdered wig or something, but it turns <laughs> out it was just a patriotic I didn't expect that. I didn't anticipate movie. that one bit. Who expected that? Oh, you thought it was going to be like a JFK? But exactly. For the... oh, okay. Everyone was surprised. <laughs> that makes sense now. Everyone was surprised that it was a straightforward 9-11. You thought movie. it was supposed to be like a like a tinfoil hat, like crazy conspiracy theory. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You guys gave me the weirdest look when I said I was that. like, what the fuck? I wasn't okay. following. Mark's the one that loved... You guys loved that powdered wig thing. I thought uh, you would get the reference. <laughs> Remember? Uh, Remember Joe Pesci in the powdered wig getting blown, Kyle? <laughs> yes. All right. I do now. Yeah, well, not you Hunter guys, needs this. Let's, yeah. not, let's say yes. Yeah, act like I'm nuts. Keep get moving out of here. Moving along here. And then Rain Over Me with Adam Sandler where he his wife had died in the Trade Center. And then, of course, we have Man on Wire. Which is crazy. The documentary about Philippe Petit who walked across a wire in between the two towers. Yeah. And actually here's him talking about how he responds to people when they ask how he feels about the towers. When people ask me like in an interview or a Q&A, uh, because I do lectures, um, they say, you know, how did you feel when the towers were destroyed? I, have a, I cannot answer that question because um, 
If you ask me how difficult it was, for me how painful it was to lose my towers, to lose two uh, architectural and engineering marvels, how can I answer that question when on the other side of that event you had thousands of lives that were lost? You cannot compare losing a marvel of architecture and losing human life. So I usually said, you know, you can imagine how I felt. Those towers were alive inside me and then uh, not anymore. So you can imagine, but I, I cannot answer that question otherwise. I think he answered it. Yeah. Yeah, he nailed it. <laughs> uh, can you imagine, though, like back in the day, if they heard this French guy talking about how they're his towers, they'd be like, get this Frenchie out of here. <laughs> Go in. Your freedom fries. <laughs> yeah. And then there was the, by the way, that was made into a narrative feature later on called The Walk with Joseph Gordon-Levitt yeah. starring. I mean, can you even imagine that? They did in 3D, Skip it. too. Yeah, I actually saw it in 3D and it didn't add anything. But Joseph Gordon-Levitt with a French accent. Mm. And he was like CG to, to look oh, like Oh, it was terrible. It was so uh, oh. dumb. And then there was Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close where Tom Hanks plays one of the 9-11 jumpers. And the kid Wait, has- Wait, what? Yeah, it's a, and the kid, there's a scene where he's talking to Max von Sydow and he's saying, I imagine my dad is this jumper. And he holds a picture up of the that famous shot of the guy in midair. Yeah, and that's what the whole premise it's is. Tom Hanks? Yeah. Oh. It's and not, no, nobody's not. made a clip of him being like, this isn't flying, it's falling gracefully. It's a quote from Toy Story. Oh, okay. <laughs> Buzz Lightyear. That worked as well as my powdered wig <laughs> reference. The people at home are going to get it. <laughs> and they're not going to like it. Yeah. And <laughs> my fave is the movie Remember Me, <laughs> starring Robert Pattinson, where it's just a standard romantic comedy, and it goes through the motions just like any other cliche screenplay, except at the end there's a little twist when he goes to wait in his dad's, played by Pierce Brosnan's office at the end. Hmm. What a day. Caroline. Hello. That's his sister in the classroom, and then the chalkboard says September 11th, 2001. And oh. The- and look at this. You guys told me about this. Robert Pattinson is in his dad's office, then it pans out to show <gasps> it's but, the Twin Towers. I thought the plane was going to be coming right there. Can you believe this? You're watching this movie and you're invested in all the characters and suddenly at the end they're like, oh, by the way, he died in 9-11. Yeah, this was a 9-11 movie. <laughs> yeah. It's... And you had no idea throughout the entire no. movie. <laughs> that's a crazy I story. love it. Though. I mean, so that is a crazy <laughs> reveal. I can't believe that's not a bigger movie because I had not ever heard about that until you guys were talking about it like six months ago. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. I know. It, it, you know, what can you do? Wait, right? so Tom Hanks has played a 9-11 jumper. And then this movie ends with a complete fucking left turn reveal that this is 9 11. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Yeah. And then we talked about United 93 and World Trade Center. A less powerful 9 11 movie, 9 11, starring Charlie Sheen. I've seen this. <laughs> I've not heard of this either. Kyle, look at the picture. It's all one location. What? <laughs> They, I heard uh, he wanted to have the time. Is that Whoopi Goldberg? Yes. Oh, my God. He wanted Aaron to have Johnson the, herself. He wanted to have the towers rebuilt for this movie, I heard, and um, they thought of doing it, but they didn't. <laughs> no. <laughs> it was actually one location in one elevator, and that's pretty much the only time. It, it's like eight perfect str- like strangers in an elevator, and it's just like, oh hey, uh, what's going on today with the elevators? Oh, I hope everything's all right. Like, boom, boom, boom. It's like... It's 9-11. No, no one says that, but like that'd be crazy. Yeah, that's the last line of the movie. He <laughs> looks at his watch and goes, it's 9-11, and it's over. How you <laughs> like me now? Yeah, yeah it's somebody once <laughs> told me the way. Hey, now, you're an all-star. <laughs> no, but it was, it was was it's terrible. Have you watched it all under? No, I uh, saw the trailer. It's oh so bad. God. Charlie Sheen is the, the big name, Yeah, basically, and, and it's like... Kind of racist with kind of like a um, a, a bicycle uh, courier in it. And everything is so off about it. It's bizarre. Jeez. 
It's terrible. But he survives. I think everyone else dies. Hey, don't give it away. Who cares? Oh, he pops out the top and rides the antenna the whole way down <laughs> he rides while away. screaming tiger blood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I want to mention, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this, The Coup, their album Party Music. On the left is their original album cover art, which was made pre 9-11. Wow. And Kyle, can you please describe this cover? This is, you know, two of the people from the group uh, standing in front of two burning World Trade Center towers. Yeah, he's holding like a beat machine. Yeah, he's holding what looks to be a detonator, but it's not. And then she has her drumsticks in the air, and it looks like they're detonating the Twin Towers. Yeah. Jeez. And this is before 9-11. Yeah. Can you explain that? I don't. I mean, if, if they shot that like live as it was happening, like that's not a safe place to be at all. <laughs> and then the yeah, picture for them. <laughs> the picture on the right is the updated album cover that was a little safe. Yeah, they went from blowing up the World Trade Centers to a martini glass with gasoline. <laughs> that martini glass looks dangerous too. Like I don't know if I would want to drink that. Yeah, it looks like it's on fire. Like I don't. Gasoline like cannot melt martini glasses. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say. QAnon is here. There's yeah. a through line of QAnon in this podcast. Yeah. And so that brings us to the finale. And so here is the final segment, which I'm just going to play one little clip. And this okay. is a little tease because on Patreon, we're going to go through the entire saga because this is too good to yeah. ignore. Of entire saga of what? Steve, Steve Ranazizi's bullshit train. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Steve Ranazizi lying about 9-11. And Steve being Liazizi. there. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> this Steve is, Lia Sleazy. Yeah. He <laughs> went <laughs> he told a story about surviving 9-11 for almost 10 years. He told many stories. And we're going to go in vicious detail in the Patreon about yeah. this. Yeah. And so as a little tease. Here is one clip of him telling the story on Mark Marin's podcast, WTF. Or I worked in Merrill Lynch for a year and a half. As an accountant or a broker? No, I was an account manager, which basically meant I was the liaison between the brokers and the clients. I would take people out to lunch, take people out to dinner. You party know. starter. Sort of the party starter <laughs> of Merrill Lynch, yeah. <laughs> Until our building got hit with a plane and oh, Christ. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the party ended right there. That's uh, yeah, yeah, that's where the part I worked on the, the 54th floor of the second tower. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah, did you evacuate that day? I, yeah, I was there, and then the first tower got hit, and we were like, you know, jostled all over the place. And oh then my the god, came on the jostled speaker, and they were like, hey, uh, explosion in tower one, um, things are being taken care of, everyone remain where you are, stay calm, we're, we're figuring things out. And uh, I was like, well, I'm going to go check this thing out. So I went downstairs, oh, yeah. walked outside. Oh, uh, yeah, good thing you did that. the pandemonium, and then I just started fucking booking it. Oh, my God. I ran to the comedy store. I got to about West Broadway story. when I stopped <laughs> yeah. and uh, caught my breath. And then they watched the second tower fall. Our tower fell first. It and did? Then, yeah, yeah. The second one that got hit. Was and listen to this lie, because he, he kind of catches himself. But he's like, this is how they explained it to me. The first one to fall, and then because it was the impact was lower, so there was more weight on top. I think is where the way it was described to me. Uh huh. That sounds like someone that really went through trauma, right? Yeah, very cash about this situation. He's they like, told us to stay there. I didn't, and I booked it. Yeah, I worked at this place until a plane hit it. Wait, what? Yeah. The creepiest part is just the his conviction, too. Even though he's casual about it, just the amount of lies he gets into every sentence. Yeah. Because he goes on to say that he was part of a urban basketball team where he worked with six guys from Cantor Fitzgerald, and that's the company that famous famously lost 90% of their staff. Yeah, they got cleaned out by the And he's like, thing. yeah, I worked, I played ball with these canner guys. Yeah. Lost a lot of good men that day. <laughs> and he <laughs> didn't even work at Merrill Lynch. No. He didn't even work at the World Trade Center. I don't even think he was in the city that day. I don't day. even think he was had a he, job. He was, yeah, he actually no, was that, in the city. No, but that, come on, you're taking his word for it. That's now. true. Yeah. Do you really believe anything He was probably on said? Long Island. I will let you know what I think. 
during the Patreon episode, which everyone needs to check out because oh, I thought we were already doing that. We have gone <laughs> too long. Yeah. All right. So not, this was this is nine eleven. You know what yeah. I mean? We this was a crash course, and we hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. We went through a lot of stuff, and on the Patreon, we're going to go through a lot more, including the entire Steve Ren and ZZ saga. You will not want to miss that. Yes. And everyone, check us out on YouTube. Patreon.com slash Death and Entertainment. You can get a free trial and see all of our exclusive content for free for a week. And, uh, yeah, we got Instagram, TikTok, everything else. YouTube is our big uh, bread and butter. Yes. Yeah, check us out there, please. Do not miss us Do for not. too long. We'll be back. But to end this, in case anyone didn't know, in 2011, 10 years after the towers fell, we had a massive galvanizing moment in this country. In case you were wondering how 9-11 ended, this is how it ended. Out here every night with hustle, loyalty, respect on my sleeve. That is a credo I have adopted from the men and women who defend the freedom of this country. We have caught and Compromise to a permanent end, Osama <laughs> bin Laden. <laughs> this is very cathartic. Some guy looks at him. People are freaking out. Well, because wrestling's fake. Is this real? Yeah. <laughs> Imagine if it was fake. <laughs> it's as real as 9-11, Mark. <laughs> So fake. Imagine if they broke this out as a fake storyline. Oh my god, that would be worse than the Owen Hart. And then Osama bin Laden's music plays now. It's like hi. Yeah, hi. And he, and he, he comes he out drops, the ring. Yeah, <laughs> no, he drops from the ceiling and it it, it, it breaks and he just lands proud on the to fucking. Be an American. <laughs> proud to be an American. Hey, look, you know, look at that guy. He's looking. He's running. He's running for president. Yeah. Yeah, that's literally the song they play for like politicians. Yeah. <laughs> and he I'm, was leaving. I'm yeah. feeling it though. I'm feeling very patriotic. I'm very warmed up. Like, yes. I love this country. I love this podcast. And I love both of you. Yeah. This guy is showing his uh, American flag eagle tattoo, fucking ready to go. That looks like a tattoo you get at Hampton Beach at like midnight. Yeah. When you're hammered. Yeah, by a prisoner. <laughs> yeah. I feel lucky. <laughs> yeah. So this is how he ends it, which is corny now, but in the moment people were probably actually tearing up i'm sorry and how do we end it with a salute okay. oh come on he wasn't even in the he never served nobody was in a movie called the marine okay okay that's good enough okay new rule you can salute if you were in a movie produced by the wwe called the marine okay if you're from south shore of massachusetts okay yeah so if you were wondering how 9 11 ended that's how it ended that's how it ended <laughs> galman can we get out of here yeah so until next time don't go 9 11 dying on us <laughs> goodbye you have just heard a true Hollywood murder mystery. I have never seen anything like this before. The movies, Broadway, music, television, all of it. A place that manufactures nightmares. Okay, everybody, that's a wrap. Good night. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. <laughs>